All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. It seems the uh, the rebooting seems to be working, so I think we're all going to be able to participate today. Uh, welcome to the October 9th uh, Forward Pinellas meeting. It's good to have everybody here today, and uh, we will go ahead and ask uh, Vice Mayor Townsend Terrapani from Tarpon Springs to do our invocation, followed by our pledge. Please bow your heads. May we meet to serve our communities, to use our resources wisely and well, to represent all members of our communities fairly, and to make decisions that promote the common good. We recognize our responsibilities to the past and the future, and the rights and needs of both individuals and communities. As trusted servants, we seek blessings on our deliberations and on our efforts here today, and may we act wisely and well. Amen. 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 Pledge, Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America. America. And, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you, Vice Mayor. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, let's go around <coughs> and introduce ourselves. We'll start with Commissioner Long down there. Commissioner, are you ready? Yes, I am. I am Janet Long, County Commissioner, District 1. Sandra Bradbury, Mayor of the City of Pinellas Park. Karen commit Karen commissioner. <laughs> it's been one of those That's days. The first time I've ever done that ever. <laughs> I didn't know I had a new last name. Um, anyway, it's Karen Seal, Pinellas County Commission. Brandy Gabbard, City of St. Pete, District Two. Darden Rice, um, City of St. Petersburg, City Council, District Four. Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commission. Whit Blanton, Executive Director. Cookie Kennedy, Mayor of the City of Indian Rocks Beach, representing Treasure Island, St. Pete Beach, Madeira Beach, Indian Shores, Reddington, North Reddington, Reddington Beach, Indian Rocks Beach, Bel Air Beach, and Bel Air Shore. Wow. All <clears throat> <All the beaches. laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Susie Sofer, uh, Commissioner in the City of Bel Air Bluffs. Raise up. Let's be Houston in Game 5. Yes. <laughs> Good for you. I'm Townsend Terrapani, Vice Mayor of the City of Tarpon Springs. Hi, I'm Julie ward Bajowski, Mayor of the Great City of Dunedin. Thank you, board. And ah, oh, there comes Commissioner Welch. Commissioner Welch, we're just going around introducing ourselves. You want to just pitch right in there? And Everybody knows I'm Dave Eggers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pinellas County Commission, Ken you're, Welch. You're too Good far. to be here. You're too far. <laughs> far this way yeah I get it <laughs> it's good to see you Ken. good to see you Chair. <laughs> all right and uh, we're going to move into uh, citizens to be heard and really this is for folks that would like to address the uh, the board on items that aren't on the uh, commission agenda or the uh, board's agenda today so if there's an agenda item that you want to speak to when we get to that we'll allow that uh, conversation to occur so anybody else that would like to speak on anything not on the agenda okay uh, and then the last, uh, just one final comment I wanted to make before we get started is that we have a really busy agenda today. <clears throat> so um, I'm looking down here to the left and to the right and saying uh, we're going to try to move this along. We've got a lot of really good topics, but we're, we just try to shorten our, our comments and that kind of thing, including my introductory right now. So we'll move right along into recognitions and announcements. Uh, Whit, all your... Okay, very good. And and for the record, last month's meeting was two hours, so yeah. Uh, yeah, we're yeah. balancing it out maybe this, this meeting. Uh, I do want to just draw your attention to um, a couple of uh, recognitions that we're having this month. First is Community Planning Month, uh, October, and uh, every year uh, the American Planning Association recognizes October as Community Planning Month, and this year's theme is Planning for Infrastructure that Benefits All. And uh, I wanted to call your attention to um, a, a forum that we are sponsoring on October 30th, Transitioning to Transit-Oriented Development. Uh, we have invited in the uh, representatives from the City of Lake Mary and also uh, Taryn Sabia from uh, the Urban Land Institute, uh, who is a professor at University of South Florida and has been working with the Tampa Bay Partnership on some transit-oriented development strategies related to value capture. And they are going to be panel members as part of that transition to TOD uh, at the St. Petersburg College Clearwater Campus uh, in partnership with the Florida chapter of the American Planning Association. And I just want to say why we're featuring transit-oriented development. We have a grant uh, uh, that we are working on in partnership with uh, Pinellas Suncoast Transit Authority and uh, the city of South Pasadena and the city of St. Petersburg for the 
uh, Central Avenue Bus Rapid Transit project, <clears throat> and that project is just really getting started, but it is to look at um, how we can uh, catalyze uh, investment uh, and affordable housing and equitable development along the Central Avenue corridor as we make that transit investment. Uh, that TOD project will also be transferable, some of the uh, aspects and prototypes and applications to other parts of the county as uh, potentially other projects like it um, uh, move elsewhere in the county. And back uh, in September last month, I was in Washington, D.C. with the American Planning Association where we <clears throat> spent one day on Capitol Hill advocating for infrastructure and uh, funding for many of the programs that are essential to communities, local governments, such as the Community Development Block Grant Program, the HOME Program, which helps provide for affordable housing, and for the reauthorization of the Surface Transportation Act. And uh, I did that with local funds, just so everybody's real clear. Um, but uh, the reauthorization of the FAST Act is about a year away. The bill expires in September of 2020, and uh, the Senate has passed a draft version on it uh, um, uh, from one of its committees, and the House will soon be taking up that measure as well. And uh, we are also in the middle of the transportation, housing, and urban development appropriation. So it's very timely that uh, we recognize Community Planning Month and think about planning for infrastructure. And our staff will uh, promote this through social media during the month of October. And again, we've got our workshop, which you have your information in your packet, uh, on October 30th at the St. Pete Clearwater Campus uh, at Drew Street. Anything else on that? Uh not on that one, so you have a proclamation in here, and we'll just recognize that. If you will, I'll roll right into the next one. Uh, typically, at the end of October and the beginning of November, we recognize Pedestrian Safety Awareness Week, uh, and so we uh, have that proclamation in your packet. Uh, daylight Savings Time ends on Sunday, November 3rd, so there is a time change, and a lot of people will be walking in the dark who uh, aren't used to that. Uh, and it's right around the time of, of Halloween, so there'll be some small kids out walking. And just this morning, I was almost hit by a car on Main Street in Safety Harbor. Um, let's say I used the full extent of my vocabulary to make the driver aware that they should have stopped. Um, but it was uh, uh, dark, and uh, they weren't looking for pedestrians, or running pedestrians anyway. Um, so we recognize this month, uh, this week, and it'll be uh, the week of, let's see, what week is it? October 26th through November 3rd is Pedestrian Safety Awareness Week. Thank you, Witt. Um, yeah, that's a, obviously in this county, it seems like we can't go a week without finding some kind of pedestrian interaction with a car or a bicycle with a car. And, mm -hmm. and um, unfortunately, in your agenda packet, there are the yeah. fatality summaries from the last couple of months that uh, the secretary uh, sends out. And we've had quite a few pedestrian and bicyclists as well as uh, motor vehicle fatalities as well. Thank you, Whit. Appreciate it. All right. Consent agenda. We have two items. Approval of the minutes of the September 11th meeting and approval of committee appointments to the LCB and the TCC. Do I have a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Yes, ma'am. Move approval. I got it from down at this end. Sorry. Next time, we'll go this way. Got it? Did you? It was. Well, Susie made the. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We've got uh, three public hearings uh, coming up, uh, countywide plan amendments. And so, again, everybody loves to hear this opening procedures that I'll go through real quickly. But um, Pinellas County pa uh, plan uh, Council uh, procedures, at this time we will hear that uh, the hearings. Uh, we'll ask the four Pinellas staff to give a uh, presentation uh, and then any of the applicant local governments desiring to do so may address their items. Once these reports are given, I will then ask for proponents of any of the proposals to speak and then opponents. And finally, any other citizens who wish to comment or ask any questions of the sub-threshold use cases. We will then hear rebuttal by the applicant as necessary and staff response or summary. Uh, at that time, the board will ask questions, close a public hearing, and deliberate and take action. Let's go ahead and get started with the first one. And Jared Austin will come up and give those presentations. Sure. Good afternoon. Uh, today I'll be going through case CW 1915 submitted by the City of Safety Harbor. That was presented to you all uh, at last month's meeting. I'll go through this as a refresher and then turn it over to uh, the City of Safety Harbor to provide you some more information on public comment. 
Um, so the City of Safety Harbor is seeking to amend a property from residential low medium to public semi-public. And the purpose of this amendment is to allow for future expansion of the Safety Harbor Public Works facility. The location is about 250 feet northeast of the intersection of Railroad Avenue and Booth Street, and the area size is roughly 1.74 acres. The existing uses are vacant, and the surrounding uses are residential and public semi-public. So this is just north of the subject property. This is the actual public works facility itself. Uh, this is just some of the residential south of the subject property. And this is just west of the subject property. Here you can see the current category of residential low medium. And while at our level, the residential low medium category does support institutional uses, the local land use designation that falls under this category does not. Hence the proposed change to the public semi-public category, which would better support the expansion of the City of Safety Harbors Public Works facility. In conclusion, we as staff believe that the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics of the public semi-public category. And on balance, we believe that it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in section 6531 of the countywide rules. In regards to public comment, um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Marcy Stenmark, who is the Community Development Director of the City of Safety Harbor, to provide more information on this. Welcome. Hey, Marcy. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Marcy. I'm the Community Development Director for the City of Safety Harbor. This is a city-initiated map amendment uh, to expand our public works facility, but we do not have a capital improvement program funding allocated this time. We haven't gone through a site plan process, and all of those steps would have to occur before we were to move forward with any kind of specific plan. We just knew that we purchased the land, and at this time, the map was outdated. We wanted it to better reflect our plans for the future. And in the future, when we go through a capital improvement program process and a site plan process, all of the residents within 500 feet will be publicly noticed, and we'll work with them on the specific design. Uh, but I am going to give a timeline of what we have been through with this process in terms of public comment. On May the 7th, we received one letter from a neighboring property owner who had some concerns and wanted to keep the neighborhood a quiet treasure. On May the 8th, the Planning and Zoning Board had their public hearing and we had two speakers who own property to the south. Their concerns with re were with regard to access, noise, and property values. Then on May the 22nd, our city manager, Matthew Spohr, and our mayor, Joe A. Uke, met with residents, the ones who had sent us a letter and spoke with us, um, and met with them individually and talked with them about our plans. At that meeting, they made a commitment to not allow access to the public works facility to the south of the property or east of the property. And I can show you an aerial of what I'm referring to. Is this where you put stuff? Okay. Okay. All right. So here is the subject property. Here is the existing public works facility. There is a platted D discrepancy to the south that's approximately 33 feet in width. When our mayor and city manager met with the residents who live along Booth Street, uh, they made a promise that no access will occur through here to get to the public works facility. Instead, any access will occur through the existing public works yard. Also, we made a commitment and have asked our city attorney to work towards determining the ownership of this plat D discrepancy, and we are going to give half of the land at least to the neighboring property owners to the south to give them more of a buffer. And we also made a commitment that when we do build a facility, we're going to keep this nice tree line to provide a nice screening and buffer for the neighborhood. And um, at that meeting and in the meetings that occurred, the residents uh, stated that they were happy and satisfied with the information they received, and no one came to the city commission's first reading to speak, uh, except for one student who goes to St. Pete College who is doing a class project. <laughs> yes, so. we get those all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our summary. Does anybody have any questions for Marcy? Just a quick one, Mr. Yes. Chairman. Yes. So back on that map, yes. what does the one and the, and the two denote, the circle one and two? Um, those are the, the blocks of the neighborhood. So this is a platted neighborhood, and this is block one and block two. And the folks that had objections, were they satisfied with the changes you made? Yes, yes. Okay. And then they have um, that not come to the city commission's first reading and haven't reached out since. But we will be sure when we get to the site plan process that we reach out to them again 
and we will have another meeting, I'm sure, with the public to talk about the design. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Marcy. Appreciate that. Thanks for the city's efforts. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Um, anybody, anybody else that would like to speak? Any proponents uh, for the project that would like to speak? Any opponents? Okay. Any other citizens that would like to be heard? All right. We bring it back to the commission. Any other questions for staff? I have a motion for approval. Move to approve. Second. Yeah. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Move on to the next one. All right, so today I'll be going through now CW 1919 submitted by the Town of Bel Air. So the Town of Bel Air is seeking to amend the property designation from residential low medium to recreation open space. And the purpose of this amendment is to allow for the expansion of the Pelican Golf Course. Uh, the location is at 1601 Indian Rocks Road for the Area A that's designated there on that aerial map, uh, and 1614 and 1616 Golf View Drive, as well as 1609, 1611, and 1617 Indian Rocks Road for Area B. Uh, the area size is roughly 3.65 acres, and the current existing uses are vacant, uh, and the surrounding uses are residential and recreation open space. Uh, so here you can just see the front of properties uh, of the subject property areas A and B. Uh, this is just some of the residential south of the subject property. And again to the west of the subject property. Uh, so here you can see the current category of residential low medium. And while we do allow for recreation open space under our RLM category, uh, the local land use the land use at the local level does not currently allow for that. Hence the proposed change to the recreation open space category, which would allow for these parcels to be incorporated into the Pelican Golf Course. In conclusion, we as staff believe that the proposed amendment is appropriate, is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics for the recreation open space category. And on balance, we believe that it can be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in Section 6531 of the countywide rules. In addition to this, just some note on public comments. Uh, for section, the Section A parcels, we were informed that the neighbors were overall happy to see the vacant residential property being developed. Uh, and for the Section B parcels, neighbors were initially concerned with fencing and landscaping but we're able to work out a wall and fence combination with the developer uh, and other concerns related uh, to this particular parcel were just with general construction noise, uh, workers, and overall uh, associated factors with an active construction site. Any, uh, any questions for Austin? Is anybody from the town of Bel Air that is here that wanted to comment? Hi there. Uh, Chris Bremo with Calvin Giordano and Associates representing the town of Bel Air. Um, the comments were primarily on the construction noise, uh, which is typical for, for some of these sites, and um, the initial look of the landscaping on the second set of properties. Initially, the developer had a complete solid screen wall of Podocarpus, which the adjacent neighbors did not particularly <clears throat> like. So they worked out a deal where they're going to do a decorative uh, fence wall, like a brick wall with a, a wrought iron top with appropriate landscaping okay. on top and some additional uh, large shade trees to, uh, to help screen the property as well. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Um, yes, sir. Uh, what's the estimated date of completion for this project now? Uh, the, the timeline has shifted a little bit back and forth. and. Um, I think they are pushing for uh, close to early next year. And the reason for that is, is that they do have a uh, PGA tournament coming to the golf course. So they need to have the golf, the golf course section operative in time for that, uh, for that um, uh, tournament. Thank you. Mayor. I was just curious. Um, can you pull up the A and B? <clears throat> okay, 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So the houses that are, uh, <coughs> I guess it would be east of A and B that are kind of in between, going to be in between the golf course and A and B. Mm -hmm. What what's happening with them? That's where you're saying the wall is going. No, no, no. The uh, the wall is going to be along the Indian Rocks roadside, the decorative so, wall. So. Okay. So if you use that point there. Bring, yeah, what's happening? Keep going east. Yeah, what's happening with those? Uh, there will be landscaping and a sidewalk and a golf cart path on that side. Uh, the neighbors that live on that side, uh, part of this process included a vacation of a portion of Althea Road. Um, yeah, I was going to ask the, yeah, the road. The road, the roadway that the golf that you looped, drive. Right, the roadway that looped back through. Part of, portion of that was uh, was vacated. And uh, the residents that were most affected by that on that eastern side of the remaining portion of the roadway were in favor of the vacation uh, because it prevented some of that cut through traffic that went through there. There will be landscaping on the, the golf course side of that property as well. And uh, the developer <coughs> is working with, uh, with those neighbors as well to come up with the right, uh, the right um, okay. landscape. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, are there any <clears throat> proponents that would like to speak on behalf of the project? Any opponents? Anybody else that would like to speak? Uh, bringing it back to the, the board. Uh, since seeing no other questions, do I have a motion for approval? Move approval. Second. Uh, Commissioner Long and Commissioner Seal. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. On to the third case. All right, uh, so this is CW 1920, submitted by Pinellas County. Um, so Pinellas County is seeking to amend the property from residential low medium to office, and the purpose of this amendment is to allow for the conversion of a residential property uh, into an office space for a small business. <clears throat> the location is at 809 546th Avenue North, and the area size is roughly 0 0.39 acres. The existing uses are residential, and the surrounding uses are residential, office, and commercial. Uh, this is just the front of the subject property. <clears throat> this is some of the office to the east of the subject property. This is just south of the subject property. And this is some of the residential to the west of the subject property. Uh, here you can see the current category of residential low medium. Uh, and while under our RLM category, we do allow for office use, uh, the local land use category that falls under this category does not allow for uh, office use. Hence the proposed change to office, which would better support the conversion of this residential property into an office space. And on conclusion, we believe that the proposed amendment is appropriate for the intended purpose and is consistent with the locational characteristics of the office category. And on balance, we believe that it could be concluded that the proposed amendment is consistent with the relevant countywide considerations contained in Section 6531 of the countywide rules. <coughs> and in regards to public comment, we were informed by Pinellas County staff that there were no public comments for Case CW 1920. Thank you, Austin. That's all right. We've all done that before. Um, any questions for Austin? Jared. <laughs> Jared. Excuse me, Jared. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. Um, all right. Uh, any proponents out there that want to speak or opponents to this? Anybody else that would like to speak? Okay. Bringing it back to the board. Uh, do I have any motion? Move to approve. Second. Did you get that? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to presentations from Commissioner Long on uh, PSTA, please. Well, PSTA has had its executive committee this morning, and unfortunately, we did not have quorums, so we couldn't really take any action. And. Um, we are <clears throat> in a good place with our budget currently. We're also speaking to the issue of um, trying to find additional revenue for PSTA so that we can complete our 
proposed projected improvements in our BRT. We did have a very successful meeting in Washington, D.C. about two weeks ago and are anticipating a final decision from them between now and the end of the year. So we're excited about that. Our operating budget is now at $85 million, and that's up 4.6% from last year, but it includes no major expansions or reductions in our service. We saw a presentation on a survey given to our non-regular riders as, as part of our performance scorecard. And in this survey, 95% of respondents agreed that PSDA delivers a valuable service to our community. 41% of the respondents had tried one of our services in the past. And we did award a contract to Kim Lee Horn to assist with the development of a transit-oriented development strategic plan for the Central Avenue BRT corridor. And this FTA-funded project is heavily supported with an in-kind match of staff time from the City of St. Petersburg and from all of us here at Forward Pinellas. So we're grateful to our partners for their support and commitment to the advancement of the BRT project and the economic development of the corridor, safe to say that that's one of our highest ridership routes. This work will build on recent City of St. Petersburg planning efforts such as the Central Avenue Revitalization Plan, which provides guiding principles for the corridor that encourage higher densities, mixed use development, and transit-oriented development. It will also enhance and provide resources for technical assistance to the planning <coughs> efforts in South Pasadena and St. Pete Beach. Our next regular board meeting is going to be held on October 23rd at 9 a.m. at PSTA. Thank you, Commissioner. Any questions for Commissioner Long? Okay. I'll just uh, point out, uh, as we've done when we have other correspondence about the Central Avenue BRT project, there is uh, a letter from uh, the St. Petersburg mayor regarding the South Pasadena Avenue uh, lane modification for that project. So I encourage you all to, to review that correspondence. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Whit. All right, the BARDA activity report. Commissioner Seal. Yes. Um, <clears throat> we, our last board meeting was on Friday, September 27th. Um, and unfortunately, we did not have quorum, although both Commissioner Long and I were there. <laughs> and um, we were presented the fiscal year 2020 budget, which we'll approve hopefully at our October 25th board meeting. Um, it is a $7.5 million operating budget, and so, which is huge. And I want to congratulate Commissioner Long because she serves on the Finance Committee and certainly has worked very diligently along with PSTA in getting our budget to where it is today. Um, next, we had an Envision 2030 presentation and it included the Tech Memo 2, which is the Transit Performance Overview, Regional Transit, Transit Network Developments, and Proposed Draft Alternatives. Um, we are going to have a um, November board workshop on the Envision 2030 plan. And finally, at that um, September 27th meeting, we had a Sarah Caper from Ford Pinellas presented um, information about the TD programs in our area along with regional product status updates. That's it. Thank you. Any questions for Commissioner Seal? Appreciate that. And we are going to jump right into Advantage Pinellas, and Chelsea, Chelsea's going to do Chelsea's this. going to come give that presentation. Uh, this is one of the most important things that we do as an MPO, is adopt a long-range plan. Uh, this will be the first one uh, since 2014. Uh, I'll let Chelsea take the lead on this, but uh, I do want to point out that in your materials at your dais, we have an updated spreadsheet that she will walk you through. These changes, um, they are happening on an almost <coughs> daily basis. That's why today is a draft, no action. Uh, but November, next meeting, uh, I encourage everyone to please be here uh, because we will be voting to adopt the long-range plan with whatever modifications you all direct, uh, either at today or next month. Yeah, this is one of our most comprehensive long-range plans with land use, transit, 
and all of the uh, normal things that we do. So Every MPO has a long-range transportation plan, but this is the first one that we've adopted since the merger of the PPC and the MPO. So we are pretty excited about it. All right. Chelsea, go ahead. Thank you. All right, so just a little reminder, but this again has been a four-phase process. We've been working on this long-range transportation plan for over two years now. So we started off doing a lot of technical work, uh, and now we're moving into that vision strategy and policy definition that we're going to be bringing to you both this month and next. Um, so what we've done so far, we did a comprehensive analysis of our environmental justice areas. Those are our low income and minority populations, just to make sure that as we developed the plan, we were considering all of our populations uh, in the public outreach that we did to make sure that our traditionally underserved populations uh, did have an opportunity to weigh in into the development of the plan. We did uh, region-wide scenario planning through the It's Time Tampa Bay. We developed uh, projections of uh, the finances that we would believe we'd have available to match with transportation uh, projects into the future. We did a comprehensive needs assessment for all of our modes. We came up with costs for every single project we put in the plan, and we've been doing tons and tons of public outreach. And that's where we are today, is to match up those revenues and the results of our outreach with the revenues um, to come up with a cost feasible plan. Um, so as we had talked about last month, uh, we brought you the results of the Advantage Pinellas MetroQuest survey. Um, we've since gone back and compared those results with all of the other outreach that we've been doing over the last two years, and we found that our outreach results are very consistent. We did statistically valid surveys, online surveys, community events, at everyone, these are, this is what we heard. Uh, first and foremost, everyone wants the tra traffic signals timed. Everyone wants a green light every time they come up to it. Uh, improved transit service was something that we heard consistently across the county. We were actually a little bit surprised. Even in our less densely developed areas, there was consistent support for rail transit, both local and regional. Uh, a lot of support for improved bicycle and pedestrian projects. And people wanted the roads maintained. There was a lot of understanding that we can't keep widening the roads in Pinellas County because it will start impacting communities. But people wanted the roads maintained, not necessarily widened. So then we get into the conversation about, okay, well, we know what the priorities are for us and our communities. How do we pay for them? There are four main funding sources uh, to fund transportation projects. And I went over these with you last month, but I'm going to give you a little reminder today. Uh, there are strategic intermodal system, local funds, uh, TMA funds, and then a source called other arterials. Uh, could you real quickly, uh, back to that one, just, again, detail. Where do the strategic intermodal system funds come from, as well as the other arterial funds? I'm going to tell you about that right now. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. So this is the SIS, uh, the roadways that you see highlighted in red. Uh, those are the SIS facilities in Pinellas County. SIS funds come directly from Tallahassee. They're from the state, and the state decides what projects they're going to spend um, uh, those, those funding on. But the funding is restricted to just these facilities. Uh, you'll notice there are not any transit facilities on this map. Even if we were to run bus service on one of these roadways, it would not be eligible for SIS funds just because of the nature and the restrictions on that funding category. Uh, local funds is another source. Uh, you all represent local governments. You know that you have quite a bit of money at your disposal. Uh, you also have quite a few needs. Uh, basically what we're thinking is most local governments are using 100% of their funding for existing needs. Maintaining your own roadways, maintaining your infrastructure, libraries, um, yeah, sewer systems. Um, it's also important to note that um, these can be used to match state and federal funds. We do have quite a lot of state and federal dollars available to us. However, most of them require a local match of about 50%. Other arterials is another funding source. These are state dollars as well, and these can be used on any state road in the county. Uh, they can also be used for non-state roads that are parallel to the state roadway system that could provide a relief to a state road. However, in order to access these for county or local uh, roadways, you have to have a 50% match. So there is the ability to flex these dollars around to pay for other priorities, but without that local match in hand, you can't do it. Um, and also, we have very few state capacity projects remaining in Pinellas County. Most of our remaining capacity uh, state roadway projects are on the SIS, and they're already considered to be uh, cost feasible and they will be funded. When we start uh, developing our projections for the long-range plan, uh, the state tells us what we can expect over the next 20 years from each of these funding categories. For other arterials, they try to divide it up a little bit by population. When we get through our long-range plan projects, we're going to be leaving almost $400 million on the table of this funding source because we don't have enough state projects and we do not have a local match for the locals to be able to utilize this source going forward. Kelsey. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Chair, yes. may, may I interrupt? Mr. Long, yes. 
This is an important uh, point that Chelsea has just made with regard to the restrictions on the state money. And I would like to just um, reiterate here what I said yesterday at our commission meeting, that for all of you that have any level of influence with our state legislative delegation, it's really important to talk to them about rethinking how transportation projects are funded and that just because we've done it that way for the last 25 or 50 years doesn't mean we should keep on doing it that way because we need those dollars to help us here in the county. <clears throat> and because we have so much that is already developed, we cannot take this money and just build additional highways. So please consider advocating for that and with our legislative folks. Yeah, Thank that's you. That's a great point. Thank you, Commissioner Long. Mayor Bradbury. Um, can we use this um, if the cities would like to do a complete street to get a match? It has to be a capacity. There has to be some kind of capacity enhancement. Um, so if it was additional transit service, it could be flexed to that because transit would provide additional capacity. But in terms of just restriping a road for complete streets, not necessarily unless you could uh, basically demonstrate that there would be a capacity improvement. Technology. Right. The reason technology. why I was asking is because yes. a lot of our east-west roads mm -hmm. are arterial roads to some of the main thoroughfares. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and I think from our perspective, you know, it, it, it takes a network of streets to really make your transportation system work. Some of the most congested areas in Florida are where they never built a network at the local level and they rely on state roads and all the local development accesses the state roads and dumps all the traffic on and off the state roads. We can think of a couple of counties around here where that's pretty pervasive. We've got a good road network for the most part of local streets, but we struggle to um, maintain them and we struggle to um, strategically improve them as growth and redevelopment occurs. And that's where flexibility is really key. We'll get into that more in the legislative discussion a little bit later, so we'll underscore that point. But I think that's what Chelsea's trying to say here is that because of how Pinellas has developed and, you know, Broward and Miami-Dade can probably put themselves in the same position, we're, we're leaving a lot of dollars on the table that are eventually going to be consumed in other parts of the state mm -hmm. if uh, we don't have that flexibility. So it's just a conversation we need to have. You Anybody else? Okay, go ahead, Chelsea. Right. Uh, and the last funding source is our Transportation Management Area Funds, our TMA funds. Uh, these are federal dollars, and they are sent to the urbanized area, and we have an agreement with the other MPOs. We try to split it up by population. These are the most flexible funds that we have. Highly flexible can be spent on any mode. Uh, these are also based on your MPO priorities. Um, so the recommendation that we made is that since this is the pot of money where we have the most control to make it flexible, let's use pretty much all of it on non-road capacity projects. So what we're doing with this cost feasible plan, the draft that's in front of you, is we're setting aside $1 million annually for our Complete Streets grant program that covers the construction grants that the local governments apply for. We're also setting aside $1 million annually for technology. Pinellas County already has the ninth cent gas tax that goes towards the uh, intelligent transportation systems, uh, timing the traffic signals, and that's great. It's built a fantastic system, but that system now needs to be maintained and upgraded. So we're gonna have this funding set aside so it could cover uh, some of those expenses, as well as additional future technologies that we may not even be aware of yet. Uh, say PSTA wants to do an automated circulator. Um, these, that this funding could go towards something like that into the future as well. So we're boxing it and reserving it so as things come up, we'll be able to use it. Uh, we're also looking to set aside $1.5 million annually for bus replacements and other PSTA capital, and then $500,000 annually for regional capital transit projects as well. And that could support the I-275 uh, BRT that's currently being studied by TBARTA. It could cover Vanpool. It could cover a whole variety of things. Could cover waterborne transportation. Waterborne transportation too. Yes, it could. <laughs> and then also of these off the tops, what we wanted to do is we developed our active transportation plan. Uh, these are the bicycle and pedestrian corridors that are being prioritized uh, over the life of the long range transportation plan, and there are ten of them all the way from North County into South County. The estimates that we have for these projects combined are is about sixty two million dollars. So we've gone ahead and we've committed to funding those over the life of the plan, all sixty two million dollars worth of them. 
So when we did all those other set asides and we looked at our numbers, we had um, a few million dollars set over, set, uh, left over. So what we decided to do is let's set that money aside for trail overpasses at high conflict crossings. So we assumed an overpass would cost about $6 million, and we believe we can fund about four of those over the life of the plan. Um, we also looked at our remaining unfunded trails. So we have about $38 million still in trail needs that is unfunded in the long-range plan. But those are our needs that we're still identifying because we want to point out where the gaps are um, between what we have, what we believe we can fund, and then what we need. And then our over, unfunded overpasses, we're still uh, analyzing those right now to see how many there are and what kind of cost that might be uh, going forward. And Chelsea, just to clarify, I think the need for those kind of grade separated trail crossings is greater than four. So it, this Absolutely. would have to be a partnership with county or other funding potentially from Sun Trail or things like that. Yes. Okay. Yes. There where are, are those four? four. Yes. Can where you? are those four? We're working on prioritizing them right now. Okay. Um, we are going to be overhauling how we do our multimodal priority list over the coming months to support the long range plan. And then we'll have some kind of criteria in there on how we select those four going forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right, so those were your federal flexible dollars that pretty much ate up all of them. So then we step, <laughs> we step back and we looked at uh, the SIS dollars or other arterial dollars, and then we are not required to put county projects in the long range plan or city projects. However, the county has so many roads throughout um, that we do include them uh, for the benefit of the public. Um, so this is where we have the updated attachment uh, that was in your packet. So this map is going to be slightly outdated as well. But as you can see from the map, there is only two lines on there that are orange, and those are unfunded needs. Um, as of yesterday, we did add uh, East Lake Road from Tampa Road up to the Pasco County line uh, to the 26 to 30 time frame. So that is now considered a cost feasible project. So the only two un un unfunded needs are going to be East or McMullen Booth Road from Tampa Road down to the Bayside Bridge. Pinellas County is going to be embarking on a study of that corridor to determine what kind of operational capacity improvements could be done to it. Um, because we don't know what's going to be done there, we can't really define it. So it's on the list as an unfunded need. It could be eligible for funding going forward, and we can always amend the long-range plan. Question? Yes, sir. The Northeast Lake piece that you talked about, what was the time frame of that again? That is in 26 to 30. 2026, 2026 time frame. to 30, um, yes. and really just funding in there for, I mean, I know there's a lot of community conversation to go before we do that, but what yes. do we have funding in there for? The assumption was widening it from a four lane to a six lane. Um, okay. That ultimate configuration would have to be decided by the county, um, but that's what we have the place okay. holder hold in for right now. Thank you. So some uh, of the yeah, changes, oh, sorry. So just the 1.7 billion through 2045, so that 1.7 billion is what is coming from the CIS funds? That's for all of the local projects. All the roadway projects that you see on here, except for the orange ones, total up to about $1.7 billion. Oh, that's a total of the project. Yes. And those, mm -hmm. and you said local, so those are state and local projects. State and county projects, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then for our unfunded, it was only about $150 million. And it's McMillan Booth. Correct. And we, or East Lake, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So what you can see from this is we have done an excellent job with our <clears> roadways <throat> over the life of the long range plan. And the fact that we were able to get almost all of our roadway projects as being cost feasible, where we believe we can fund them between now and 2045, is just a testament to that. Uh, no other local governments that I'm aware of, no other MPOs are able to do that with this plan. Um, so the updated spreadsheet that you have in front of you, we broke the projects out into the five-year increments, uh, uh, or the, the time buckets that were required to. The first one is for 2025. 20, uh, and you'll see the I-275 from Roosevelt up to 4th Street project on there. That's that second express lane in each direction. Um, and then there are several county projects mixed in on uh, 46th Avenue North, 54th Avenue North, Fisher Road, and then Forest Lakes Boulevard from 580 to 584. The next time frame that we're looking at is 26 to 30. So on there you'll see the US-19 Tampa Road Interchange project. Um, several county roads on Starkey, Belcher, Bel Air, and 126th. There's also US-19, the Alderman Interchange in that time period, uh, Gandy Boulevard from 4th Street over to the bridge, and then the three at the bottom that are highlighted, those were formerly in another time uh, bucket. Those have been moved up into this one, and that's 22nd Avenue South, 62nd Avenue North, and that section of East Lake that we just talked about. 
on the back side. Any questions? Let's oh. go. Well, go well, yeah, I was trying yeah. to wait. wait oh, yeah. 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 All right, let's, let's go ahead. Do okay. you want to finish it up? And or, Let's just take it now. Uh, Commissioner Welch, go ahead. Well, I'm glad um, that we have 22nd Avenue South and 62nd on here. And I was caught in your numbers. Did you say why those are highlighted in yellow? Because in the copy that you received in your packet before, yes. those were in the 31 to 35 time frame. So those were moved up over the course of the last 24 hours, basically. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes, Mayor. Thank you. Um, the items that are in the 2025, mm -hmm. how long have those been on the books to get done? Um, quite a while for some of them. Uh, especially the Forest Lakes, for example. 30 years? I would have to defer to the county on that one. <laughs> and then the I-275, that is a newer project, um, because the one, the one express lane is currently under construction, and the plan had been that that would be one express lane, even going over the Howard Franklin Bridge. A couple years ago, the plan changed to make the Howard Franklin have two express lanes in each direction. So that's what that is. That's a cleanup to ensure continuity for the corridor. Um, I'm going to ask Commissioner Wells to... Uh, agree with me on this, that items 28 and 13 that have been on the books for 30 years need to be moved up to the top, mm -hmm. above ones that probably have been on there just recently, mm -hmm. 10 years out. Mm -hmm. I really uh, seriously think that we need to consider the length of time that the items have been on there mm -hmm. before we consider other items, especially those two health, safety, welfare, those are safety issues that need to be encouraged to be bumped up further. And I will say that those two in particular, those are being funded with Penny for Pinellas. So mm -hmm. that's through the Pinellas mm -hmm. County CIP. So we are deferring to the county on the phasing and relative timing of those projects. But again, we include them because there are so many county facilities. So we want people to be aware. I, I think if there's any other funding to help get those bumped up mm -hmm. instead of waiting for other funding sources that it would be very important. And that's part of the conversation that we're having about a transportation funding strategy you may have read about in the paper recently. Um, the county has allocated Penny for Pinellas funds and it's a matter of phasing and timing that in, through their capital improvements program. And the transportation trust fund at the county level um, is used to maintain existing roadways and the county has been talking about the issues with that trust fund that uh, by 2022, they'll have to drop the level of service of that without an additional funding source. So um, we're, we're, I wouldn't say we're at a crossroads, but we are having a serious conversation. And one of the things that that conversation could yield and be fruitful in is, is a commitment of some additional local dollars to match state dollars that could potentially expedite some of these projects that have been out there for a long time. And I know the public does get very frustrated when they see projects on the books for 20 or 30 years and people have been talking about it. You're not the only one frustrated, um, but it's a matter of, of priorities and dollars. And uh, that's where um, it gets tough when the dollars don't go as far as the needs do. So we are having that conversation and I'm hopeful within the next year we'll have resolved that conversation. I am pleased that they got moved up from being pushed back yeah. to the second page. <laughs> but I, I, not a backbencher anymore. Well, I, I seriously would like to stress that it's been long enough. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Gabbard. Um, I just want to understand the cost estimate and the cost in the year of expenditure specific to some of these um, interchanges. Mm -hmm. So like number 21, um, that the cost estimate on that one is you know, so high and, um, you know, dramatically reduces the cost in the year of expenditure. But that all the other on ones, part. okay, yeah, all I right. I it last night. It's now fixed on the online packet. So it didn't make it into your copy, though. Then is it? It's $157,003,697. Uh, These are numbers that we got directly from the state. Um, so on the SIS facilities, many, most of them were already inflated, so you won't really see that different, but those numbers will be in the year of expenditure. So that $229 million was that 
typo. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then um, just one other point. I just wanted to make sure this number 20, um, the Gandy Boulevard, 4th Street West, yes. that is that last overpass, correct, that Bay. we're talking about. Yes. And it'll connect to the bridge. Right. You won't see the Gandy replacement in this because we have been advised that that is going to be reflected in Hillsborough County's uh, in their long range plan. Okay. Um, but the bridge will go with that piece. Okay, yeah, that is so important to that goal and that dream of finally going all the way from the Skyway mm -hmm. to the Crosstown without any stops. Yes. So I'm glad to see it in there. Of course, I'd like to see it higher, but uh, I'm glad to see that it's on there. So yes. thank you. Okay, Commissioner Seal. I uh, yes, so Mayor, mm -hmm. um, we have not had the conversation yet on the next penny for Pinellas. Um, starting in 2020, we have an outline of some suggestions, but we haven't had a serious discussion at that point. So I will certainly advocate. Um, Commissioner Welch knows that 22nd Avenue South that I've been one of his biggest supporters. Yeah. <laughs> on that road, um, and you know, obviously 62nd is important as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we will. I will definitely advocate for that. Um, in turn. I do also want to point out, and you all know my passion for US 19, <laughs> and you know, frankly, to see the right of way slip from 2021 to 2026 and deferred construction 2025 to 2028 due to CIS monies, um, I find very discouraging. At the very least, I'd like to see that Tampa Road interchange done sooner because at least up to that point, it helps East Lake Road because it is a parallel roadway. And um, I just think it's really important to get that done. North County has loved the improvements and the interchanges and people will attest to a 10 minute at least savings and commute time. And I just think it's really critically important to at least get that interchange, if, if at all possible, moved up. Um, that has been talked about for at least 30 years. Um, I had the task force in 20, 2000, excuse me, and so now it's 20 years. And granted, we did get a lot of the interchanges moved up, which we're very thankful for. Um, but people are very grateful for the improvements and at least want to see that one um, done sooner. And on that point, uh, I'm trying to remember, when is the Curlew Road now scheduled for construction? The Curlew is supposed to start next 22. year. <clears throat> I don't think it's, it's been back. Uh, north Excuse side me? of Curlew. Say it again. 21-22. That's the year it starts mm -hmm. construction. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it'll be done. It's a two-year project. Uh, three. Three. Four. Okay. So it's a, we, 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 are we talking about a project that goes through 2024? Probably. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like, I, you know, I think there's a lot of parallel work that be, can be going on, like construction or uh, you know, the design work, uh, sure. right-of-way acquisition for Tampa Road. I don't know how you start construction on another intersection until the Curlew Road is done, mm -hmm. uh, but I do think you're right. We need to be ready to go as soon as possible mm -hmm. on Tampa for sure. We are working very closely with the department to um, to work on design, work on phasing of these projects. We're keeping them high on our priority list for that reason, um, and we are working with them on other um, operational and innovative intersection improvements along the way, too, to have those plans in place when funding becomes available for construction. But Commissioner, you're absolutely right, and we agree with you. Well, and again, you know, and I respect adding the additional express lanes on I-275, but that is a newer project, and sometimes it's discouraging when you've had a plan for improvements for many, many years and to see something come in and basically then another project that's been in the works falls, falls backwards. So. We are going to have a discussion in just a few minutes on the draft tentative work program, and so that might I be... I know, I've, and I have other questions about that sure. at that point. Commissioner Welch. Thank you. I uh, just want to echo Mayor Bradbury and, and Chairman Seale. Um, I had shiny, beautiful black hair <laughs> we're starting talking about 22nd Avenue South. Chair Welsh, you had hair? I, I've got photos. It was in the <laughs> first or second penny, and we had the recession and cutbacks and different reasons, but that was a promise, and I know we've done some work <clears throat> in the Gulfport <throat> area west of 58th, um, but that, that's been longstanding. I guess my question is, 
there are parts of 62nd and 22nd that don't have any sidewalks. They're gaps. Mm -hmm. Are we going to move forward in some of the pedestrian improvements and bike improvements? Or are we going to wait until this project? No. No, okay. the county's already been out there on 62nd filling in some of the gaps, okay. especially in the section between uh, 49th Street and 66th Street, mm -hmm. and also on 22nd Avenue South. I believe right. it's in two years from now there's a plan to put in some sidewalks along that okay. portion of the corridor. All right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Council Member Rice. Both. Um, I might be getting ahead. We haven't gotten to the cost feasible transit map, have we? Not yet. Okay. Wait well, thank you for um, uh, pushing uh, the, the project number 28, the 22nd mm -hmm. Avenue South mm -hmm. project up the list. Thank you. Mayor. I, I got the eye roll. You all got to talk, and I got the eye roll. I, I'm me, teasing you. Well, I didn't mean it's, to. It's the day of teasing. <laughs> if I did that, um, it's just kind of... No, I want to jump on the... <clears throat> excuse me, the bandwagon about US-19 and Tampa Road, because if you look at the, the big push for Curlew is because of um, the accidents, the safety issues, and Tampa Road is just slightly behind Curlew. Right. So it's not even about how long it's been on the list. It's about the safety issues, and, and those safety issues at those two intersections outweigh many other and the work in between the intersections right. where they're going to be having abilities right. to cross in a safe manner as well. So, so yeah. I mean, we'll see the fatality reports later, but yeah. I'll just point that out. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Okay. And on the second page of your handout, we have the other two time periods, um, 31 to 35 and then 36 to 45. You'll see mostly county projects um, in that first time period. The three that are shaded at the top in your original packet, those were actually in an early, earlier time frame. We had to move some things around to advance 22nd, 62nd, and East Lake. So those shifted down a little bit. And then you'll see also the Klosterman interchange on there, and then the improvements on US 19 from 66th Avenue up to 118th Avenue. That includes that Gandhi Boulevard interchange and whatever, whatever the ultimate improvements coming out of that study are going to be. And then the last time period, again, quite a few county projects uh, scattered throughout Pinellas County. Um, and then number 36 is the connection from the Gateway Expressway coming down onto Roosevelt near Martin Luther King Street. Um, the Tyrone Boulevard at the Pinellas Trail. Uh, when that bridge, uh, where Tyrone Boulevard flies over the trail, when that bridge becomes uh, structurally deficient, it will be replaced. And the plan is to keep Tyrone Boulevard at grade and to bring the trail up and over the top of it. So that's why that's in there, the outer time period. And then also improvements to Gandy Boulevard from US 19 over to I-275. And then you'll see the two unfunded projects at the bottom. Uh, that is a ramp from I-275 northbound going on to Elmerton Road. This one's been on the, on the books for a while. We've been waiting to see what the improvements to the Gateway Expressway, Howard Franklin, and the Gandhi Bridge improvements are going to do to that area to see if this is even needed. But we didn't want to delete it. We wanted to leave it in just in case. We can always come back and amend the plan if we do decide to advance that project any earlier. And then the last one is that McMullen Booth Corridor oh, pending the uh, county study on it. So that's it for the cost feasible rows. I didn't want to move ahead until I answered any questions that you might have had the projects. Go ahead. All right. Um, and I will point out, as said on the slide, this does not include maintenance costs. We spend a very large amount of money, uh, all the local governments in the state, on maintaining our roadways, but it's almost impossible to get our finger on how much is actually being spent on those. Uh, but maintenance costs are not included in this uh, table. And that's important because when we get to transit, uh, transit we do have the numbers for both operating um, and capital improvements. Uh, for the life of the long range plan, what we're projecting is we'll be spending about $344 million in capital funding. This includes those set asides that we had for uh, PSTA bus replacements and regional capital. Um, this does not assume any new service. Uh, it is basically the business as usual that PSTA has been operating with. Um, and that includes $1.63 billion in operating funding. Uh, we did come up with an unfunded number. We went back and we looked at those priority corridors that we've talked with you about and additional enhancements locally and regionally. And you can see there the numbers are almost double. So our unfunded need for transit, uh, what we're projecting is $345 million for capital, $1.1 billion for operating. And I'll also point out this does not include CSX or any kind of uh, uh, non-rubber tired solution across the bay, say a light rail on the Howard Franklin Bridge, for example. Those costs are not included in this unfunded number. No, one minute, Council. So I, I just wanted to emphasize that again. Um, the only bus rapid transit um, code that I see on here is the Central Avenue BRT. Correct. 
So none of the other BRTs that we've been looking at in other corridors. So in order to fund some of these other BRTs we've been talking about, we're basically looking at some other type of local it, matching fund. It would require new revenue. Yeah. Yes. So we only assumed existing revenue sources for this. Mm -hmm. So the state does have some funding that's allocated for limited operations, uh, typically service development grants. Um, which, are, which expire after three years, for instance, and then you're on the hook. So you have to be real cautious in taking service development grants because you are then going to be committed to funding it after the three years, or you start and stop transit projects all the time, and that doesn't help really anybody. Um, so we have laid out a fairly ambitious uh, needs uh, plan for transit, uh, and there are state dollars available that we could use for that needs plan but you have to be able to commit your share of the capital cost and you have to be able to commit your sh your operating dollars to operate and maintain that service and we are not uh, in a position in this county to, to say we can do that today so that's why we have such a high unfunded um, list of needs here go ahead um, so this graphic right here shows the desired spending my mode. We went through and we looked at all of the public outreach that we've done. We had the little penny game, we had the ball game, and we asked people, how would you like your chunk of transportation dollars spent? Um, general consensus was about 40% uh, to be spent on complete streets, bike ped, and technology investments, about 40% for transit, and about 20% of their dollars to be spent on roadways. And that number at the bottom, that's where we ended up with the long range plan. 10% for complete streets, bike, ped, and technology, 15% for transit, and this is capital, not necessarily, not, not, or not including operating, and then 75% is being spent on our roadways. A lot of this is because of the restrictions that we have on our funding categories and our inability to flex some of those dollars. And I will remind you, those TMA dollars that we had the ability to flex, we flexed pretty much all of them. However, that pot of money was only about $350 million, so that money did not go very far. So for our next steps, uh, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be finalizing this cost feasible plan. We're going to continue to tweak some numbers, make some uh, for final adjustments. We'll develop all of the documentation. And then next month, we hope to have a concise summary report with all of this information available for you to, um, to adopt at your November meeting. On the, on the, you just said $350 million for? The, the, the federal funds that are the most flexible, right. it's only $350 million right. over the life of the plan. Could you uh, put somewhere side by side, and not necessarily now, but when you come back, um, mm -hmm. all the different funding amounts that you're by category? Absolutely. That, that would be just provided so we get to get perspective again, what mm -hmm. we're talking about yep. over, that, over the life of the uh, LRTP. Yeah, I will say the SIS uh, is bringing in over that time about $556 million. And other arterials is about $1.1 billion. So $350 million in flexible funds was a significantly, significantly smaller pot of money. Um, but even the spending graphic on the screen right now, I will tell you in former long-range plans, we have not flexed those dollars. We've used them all to advance um, the roadway system. So where you see the 10%, that used to be 0%, zero uh, with former long-range plans. So we're starting to move the bar with this one. And if I could just underscore a couple of points, uh, the, the reason this plan is important, uh, first is uh, we are aligning it with our land use vision. As I mentioned yesterday, uh, we say land use first, transportation second. So our countywide land use plan that the Board of County Commissioners had a first hearing on, the, the changes to the countywide plan, that's, that's the broad vision for where to guide growth and development and redevelopment in Pinellas County and where to preserve what needs to be preserved. And this should reinforce that and support that. Every year, we will bring to you a list of multimodal transportation priority projects or transportation alternatives priority projects or regional projects that we prioritize through our Transportation Regional Incentive Program or the TMA Leadership Group. All of them have to be on the Long Range Transportation Plan or consistent with the Long Range Transportation Plan, um, unless they are just purely county-funded projects and then they don't have to be, but we'd like to make sure that they are consistent. Uh, the, the other point that I want to underscore with all of this is that next meeting you will also see a set of goals, objectives, and policies that will also inform how we would like to move forward uh, in advancing these different projects and alignment and coordination with all of our partners. 
So what you're seeing now, tables, numbers, maps, uh, you'll have a little bit more of a picture on the policy framework for the plan next month. And then you'll have a, uh, a full long range plan document uh, sometime early in 2020. Any other questions for Chelsea? Okay. You want to say anything about the public comment period? Oh, yes. So we are asking for action today to open what we want to call a public comment period. We're going to take all of the maps and tables and post them online and invite public comment all the way up until the public hearing to adopt the plan next month. And you need um, our approval for that? Correct. Okay. We would like to have a motion for that? Move, Move approval. To. Second. Okay. Do you want to call them? Council Member Gabbard and Mayor Bradbury. <laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Mr. Thank Chair. you, Chelsea. Mr. Thanks, Thank you. Chelsea. Chelsea, please, if I may, <laughs> how, how long will the public um, public input, how, how long will that be open? It will be open up until the public hearing when we adopt at your next meeting in November. At the next meeting? Correct. And you'll have the results from it then? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And when are you going to get it up and running? Well, it will be posted tomorrow online. Okay. okay, we're going to switch uh, item 7D and move down to 7E, which is the FDOT 2021-24-25 draft tentative work program. We're going to do that first, and then we'll go back up to the I-275 second. All right, good afternoon, board. Um, let's see here. So I'm going to take you through the FDOT tentative five-year work program. Um, this is going to run from fiscal year 21 through fiscal year 25. And Jensen Hackett, FDOT, for the record, I knew that's what you were looking yeah. for. <laughs> it says here, but I just wanted you to introduce yourself. So good to have you here. All righty. So the tentative work program for fiscal 21 through fiscal 25 uh, covers phases and activities of projects scheduled from July 1st of 2020 through June 30th of 2025. Year one of the work program is included in the state's proposed budget, and this is pending legislative uh, session approval as well as governor approval on July 1st. Years two through five are commitments for production and financial planning purposes. And these projects that are included include FDOT managed projects as well as locally managed projects with FDOT involvement. So FDOT's work program is a five-year program that includes public transit, seaport, airport, and rail projects. And it also includes transportation planning, intelligent transportation, and intelligent transportation systems planning, highway design, right-of-way acquisition, as well as construction activities. So right now we are under the adopted fiscal 20 through fiscal 24, and those are the years there um, underneath year one, two, three, four, and five. So every year on June 30th, the current year of the work program ends, and on July 1st, year two moves up to become the new current year. So just like that nifty graphic shows there. <laughs> <laughs> and so then what happens is uh, the new fifth year is added to the program, and the funding is allocated to the next phase of projects programs in the prior four years. New projects are then added into the new fifth year based on the Florida Transportation Plan goals, statewide programs, and local priorities. And so this is where we currently are in the process with the tentative work program. So this is showing year one as fiscal year 21, year two as fiscal 22, year three as fiscal 23, year four as fiscal 24, and year five as fiscal 25. We just put our LRTP uh, based on long range assumption of revenues. And do those get changed for that five year period every year? I mean, do we, you guys adjust those numbers in the five year plan each year? These are adjusted as that new fifth year comes in, yes. Okay. And, uh, and if there are changes from year to year, they can also change? Correct. Okay. So then, we, then our plan has to adjust on the fly from that. Okay. Thank you. So this presentation uh, will outline the changes to those first four um, years of the work program as well as projects that are added to that new fifth year. So the proposed work program will then be submitted to the Florida legislature later this year and will then move to the governor for review and signature. And now this year is an accelerated cycle, so the legislature actually meets in January of this year through March. Um, and so we will have to give uh, the tentative work program to the legislature for review then to be signed by the governor and approved on July 1st of 2020. 
So after the governor does sign the work program, the first year is included inside the Florida state budget and the work program is then considered adopted. So in the program development process, what we do with that work program is we preserve the existing program and deliver unfunded phases of the program. We provide cost estimate updates as well as adding new projects into the first four years as well as the new fifth year. Some of the projects that are included are safety and security projects, system preservation projects, multimodal enhancements, operational improvements, as well as capacity improvements. And these are all based on MPO priorities, regional priorities such as the TMA priority list, as well as SIS and FDOT priorities. So new projects that are not previously included in the work program will be included here, as well as new phases of existing projects. So these will involve PD&E, Project Development Environment, Preliminary Engineering and Design, or PE, Right-of-Way, ROW, <coughs> Construction, CST, Design Build, as DSB, and Grants. And so before I move into the uh, projects on the list here, um, if you have a project in mind that is already part of the work program that is not listed in this presentation, that just means that nothing has changed on that project. So in terms of Pinellas County uh, for planning, for the metropolitan planning, um, this was added to fiscal year 2025. These are the uh, planning dollars that the MPO gets, as well as planning model studies, and these are done through FDOT. This was also added to fiscal year 2025. Both of those were priorities on the uh, Fort Pals priority list. Transit was also added, uh, the PSTA bus replacements. Um, this was $1.5 million um, of capital added to fiscal 2025. And for roadway projects, Forest Lakes Boulevard from State Road 580 to State Road 584 Tampa Road. Um, this is in uh, adding lanes and rehabilitate the pavement project. This will also include a 10-foot trail on the western side of the roadway. Um, PE was added in fiscal 23 and construction was added in fiscal 25 and this was an MPO priority. Alt US 19, State Road 595, Palm Harbor Boulevard at Florida Avenue. Um, this is the roundabout there in Palm Harbor. Um, this was also on the MPO priority list. Right-of-way was added in Fiscal 21 with construction added in Fiscal 22. For I-275 and State Road 93, this is from 54th Avenue South to south of Roosevelt Boulevard. This is adding lanes and reconstructing the interstate. This is part of the Manage and Express Lane system. Right-of-way was advanced from 23 to 21 and construction was deferred from Fiscal 24 to Fiscal 25. And this goes back to some of the um, reductions in the SIS system. I know that Commissioner Seeley, you were just talking about that um, a minute ago. Um, some of those reductions came in with the forecasted revenues across the state, and so that's why that was deferred to fiscal year 25 for construction. So Tarpon Avenue from south of Huey Avenue to US 19, this is an intersection improvement. This deals with the um, second intersection um, on Tarpon Avenue with that shopping center on the northwest corner. Construction was added for fiscal 22 for some um, pedestrian improvements as well as intersection improvements at that intersection. US 19, State Road 55 from north of County Road 95 to south of Pine Ridge Way South. Um, this is a new interchange and right of way was deferred from fiscal 21 to fiscal 26 and construction was deferred from fiscal 25 to fiscal 28. This does include the um, Tampa and Nebraska interchanges. And again, this due to revenues across the state with the SIS system, this is why this was deferred to 26 for construction and 28 as um, construction. So did money go elsewhere in the state or is there just a total reduction in dollars available? It was a total reduction of the dollars available and that's why that was moved out and deferred. However, the SIS plan does go 10 years, so this is still captured in the SIS plan um, that goes out, but we will look for opportunities to possibly advance the uh, funding on this as revenues become available as they are redone annually. And I think that's, I think that's a point you just made over and over. This is like such an important intersection and a high priority for this county. Um, so I, I don't know, that, that's a huge, drop back. I didn't realize it was going, I mean, I'm sure you did. You've had these conversations, but it just has, I haven't seen it in green and white um, as, you, as you're showing it here. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's troublesome. So continue. And well, and further, you know, I can go back in history and documents, but I'm going to guess it's already slipped before. So, oh, um, yeah. you know, that's. You it, had it, some deferrals last year as well. Mm -hmm. Those deferrals last year were primarily because of the uh, 
the war, the, uh, the hurricane damage on the up in Pensacola, but maybe that was these. Part of it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, Welcome. So, so I thought I'd come up here and try to help a little bit on understanding the revenue side of it because um, you're not the only ones feeling the pain. Um, I, I've already spoke with Pasco County. We've got Hillsborough and Hernandez Citrus still to talk to. Um, we base our um, program on we have what's called so many of you familiar with the revenue estimating conference and mm -hmm. they meet every six months and every six months they basically come back with a forecast an economic forecast and they tell us based on their forecast how is that going to impact us and so um, and I was given a bunch of the numbers and you'd be surprised how big these numbers are but statewide um, revenue estimating conference reduced our revenues uh, in the five-year work program by 225 million dollars by projecting lower fuel consumption, in part because they see the economy slowing down in their forecast, in part because they see that perhaps resulting in lower tourism, which also would reduce rental car fees and other sources of income that we have. They see less people buying new cars, which would reduce our initial registration fees that we get for um, our revenue. Um, and they also are looking now more at the, ad, the, the, the emergence of electric vehicles and greater fuel efficiency. And so they're seeing the gas tax revenues decreasing more rapidly than they had in the past. What unfortunately that also does, a lot of our work is done off of Garvey bonds, which are basically we bond future federal funding and use that as the basis to pay back on those bonds. When those projections come in, they're also saying we're likely to get lesser federal funds in, and so our bonding capacity has dropped. Um, another thing that's happened, and maybe it's because we've had such a great economy over the last number of years, um, the very first thing that we do before we start looking at any capacity projects is we preserve our existing system. And the biggest cost involved in all that is our resurfacing program. And by state law, we have to keep at least 80% of our roadways at a certain pavement level, pavement condition level. We had projected that we were going to be able to do that based on our five-year work program. What we found is that our pavement is failing quicker in many places than what we had anticipated, primarily because we have a lot more trucks out there delivering the Amazon deliveries and the, everything that's going on with trucks and just more traffic on the roads. <coughs> that um, actually cost us about $200 million that we had to reduce mm -hmm. and about $529 million that we had to move out in the program. When we start moving things around, it's really more of an art than it is a science because we have to balance each year according to what those revenues are. And so when you look at something like um, for instance, the I-275 project, you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. If I move that out, then I've got to find hundreds of millions of dollars to move in, which we may not have available or that we, we really can't. We don't want to move those hundred million dollar projects out of our five years because that's CIS money that's earned on project merit, not based on the priorities of the MPOs and all that. It, it is related to that, but it's we're competing with the rest of the state to get that money. If that money goes into the second five of the SIS, which is much more volatile in terms of how that money gets allocated, we could potentially lose that. The other thing we'll, you'll find is that in some cases we've had to say they say we need to free up $60 million in year 23. We may have to, for instance, move out an $80 million project, but it also allows us to move a $20 million project in. And so we've looked for opportunities to do those things as well. And so um, I know it's, 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 you know, it's hard because I know these are all good projects and we want to fund them all and we have them all shown in there. But it is right now, unless the Revenue Estimating Conference at their next conference or ones after that gets more confidence in the economy and increases our revenues, if they do, these will be the first projects we'll move back in. Um, those are not. Now, one thing I can tell you, and I know not, it's not possible with everybody, but what we have done, primarily with Pasco in, Her in Hillsborough County, is, is there's been a few times where they've said, I'll use Big Bend Road and I-75. If you've ever ridden through there, it's a mess. Um, what they did was they said, 
this project is so important, what we're going to do is we're going to partner with you and put the money into the project, our money into it. Say you want to build it in 24, and then we've got the money in 28. Say that's what it is. And then in 28, we pay you back. And we're doing that on Big Bend and I-75. We did that on the State Road 56 extension in Pasco County. We're doing uh, some of that on the, uh, a similar thing on the, the new State Road 52 realignment. So there are opportunities. Um, I know not everybody would have that you know, capacity or the money there to do it. But if there was a project that um, we can always You're aware. pay back the money in later years if the county, for instance, said, you know, we would prefer to, to build it sooner. Maybe we could partner. We'll find, try to find some money to put in there. The county can put some money to finish up the project, and then we pay you back at the time that it's in the work program. Question for you. Um, you said it, they meet twice a year? They do. And when was the last time they met? Um, it was just recently. It was, that's is, why these new allocations those are the came new, down. That's new, is there like, a, like the last, say, couple of years where you can show uh, how that – how that's increasing or decreasing so that we can get yeah, a sense of a that. trend we, we can what's I mean yeah yeah and it's really uh, the, the the revenue estimating conference um, and they don't just do with transportation they, oh, I they do with a lot of things for all the tax revenues um, they seem to be pretty positive on the economy for a long time and then just recently they've they, they kind of said well we're a little bit nervous that maybe we're gonna see a, a, a downturn a little bit I don't think they forecasted a, a collapse or a huge, but when you start making those little changes and then they start affecting your bonding capacity and then they start... It kind plus of multiplies. our almost. resurfacing yeah. program, um, years ago we were at like 90%. And the decision was made, if 80% is the actual goal, um, and it doesn't mean the other 20% is all potholed and everything. It means it's just it isn't as good as... What rest. is that standard, by the way? What's that number that you're talking about for the roads? Um, what we say is we, there's a... We have, we have um, pavement condition that we, right, and right. there's an acceptable pavement condition, and the acceptable pavement condition is pretty good, but it means it's probably within a year or two of probably needing to get resurfaced. We're required by law to have 80% of our lane miles meet that every year, and for years, we had it at 90 or more. And then some folks said, well, why do we have to be so at 90? We could use that 10% of the money and maybe build some new projects, and you know, we're not gonna let any road get horrible but maybe we should be closer to 80 than, clo than 90, and uh, maybe the road can last a couple more years and we can build an interchange as a result of, of waiting those couple of years. But in the last few years, the, the, we're just seeing that, especially in, um, on, our, on our interstates and our major arterials, and pavement condition is dictated almost, in, almost entirely by truck traffic. The big 18-wheelers, they pound those that pavement. You, you need so many cars to equal one truck. It's, it's ridiculous. But because we've had so much more freight traffic and all of that, it's just causing our pavement to fail quicker. And so we're projecting if we don't put this additional money into the resurfacing program, we're going to drop below the statutory requirement of 80%. So money that was going to be used for capacity projects had to be shifted to cover the resurfacing on, on enough lane miles to get us to the statutory requirement. Yeah. Thank you. And that's, that's disconcerting. But that, that, and that change just happened. The last uh, conference didn't show that yet, did it? That, it started to see a little bit. It was sort of like it was starting to, like, flatten yeah. out. You know, for a while there, we were adding because we were getting yeah, more. Yeah. And then it started to flatten out, and I think it's been within the last six months that, um, that I guess <coughs> they've decided that they've seen their, a little more pessimistic outlook. Yeah. Um, if they come back up, but I can tell you, like a project that we would move out like that, that's the first one we want to move back in. So if something happens, sometimes a project, we may find a project we no longer are going to do for whatever reason, and we have the ability to move a project in, the ones that we had to move out are the ones we look first to move in. Okay. So uh, we're not saying that it's necessarily going to be in those years. We're saying in the puzzle that we're creating to balance out all our revenues and our costs, that's where we're putting it for now. And I, I know it's disappointing. It's disappointing to us, too. Yeah. Um, but... We will work to do what we can. Yeah. Okay. Jensen's got a few more slides. Just to be yeah. Fair. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mayor, did you have a question? Uh, I did. Secretary. <clears throat> Thank you for being here, by the way. Um, I was just curious. You're saying that the you know the gas tax isn't recovering as well, and and that you know people are using less gas and the electric cars, and those are some of the things affecting your funding sources. So my I'm curious is. 
anyone, not necessarily you, is anyone talking to the legislature as they're going into their budget season to try and offset any of this? Because I understand why your funding would go down. Mm -hmm. Very specific, coming from specific places. Doesn't mean the whole economy is going to respond the same way. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm just curious, is anybody speaking with the legislature or... There have been discussions about <coughs> looking at it longer term. One of the real concerns right. is today and for the longer term, you know, the gas tax is basically a regressive tax, and so um, if we continue to get more electrical electric vehicles and we continue to get better fuel efficiency, which you want, which we want, um, we're going to see lower that. Right. So what there, there's been talk about various options. One could be would you increase the gas tax, which has been met not all that favorably for the most part. There's a talk about a, a use tax, like a mileage tax. In other words, you have to put a device on your car and you get taxed based on the mileage. And there's also been talks about for electric vehicles, perhaps there's some kind of a surcharge that they're charged for operating an electric vehicle. Unfortunately, a lot of times, you know, adding those types of things are not the most popular thing. I can't say whether the legislature is considering those. Um, this year we have the early session, and that's part of the reason why everything is rushed this year. I mean, we usually had two more months to get all this stuff figured out, but because the legislature starts in January this year instead of in March, we have to get it to them, and that's why we're kind of in a short cycle. Uh, I, so I'll say it to you for the benefit of you and your folks and to our folks, I think it's important to be not only looking at today if things are going down, because this will happen every 10 years. Right. Um, I do think... <coughs> legislature should be looking at uh, some more stable funding options mm -hmm. for what we have and understand that you know I mean our tourism may be going down but I'll repeat this over and over and over again in Pinellas County we have 15 and a half million people visiting us with only a million people living here and that's only in our county so look at the strain and 90 percent of them are coming in vehicles mm -hmm. So even if that's dropping eighty five percent, it's still a whole bunch. It is. And we still need money to fix those things to make the people that actually live here their lives a little bit better. Not fifteen so. millions over the year. So just yes. so people are listening. It's not fifteen and a half million dollars fifteen and a half million people per year. Right. So it's doubling our road people on the roads. I mean people that are here and people yep. on the roads. So. Yeah, and and believe me, we hear in that the folks in Orlando are saying that. The folks in Miami are saying that. Everybody sure. has so many tourists here that, but they also contribute to our, you know, our gas taxes. Yeah. They contribute to sales taxes. Um, so, but, and of course, if that tourism number goes down, um, then our revenues go down, and that's part of what this whole revenue estimating thing was. So. <clears throat> we do have a legislative discussion, priority discussion coming up on the agenda. So, hold so that thank thought. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Secretary. I know you have a couple more slides for us. Just okay. a couple. <laughs> All right, so um, moving back along, US-19 and State Road 55 from north of Nebraska Ave um, to just south of Timberlane Road. This was to add lanes and reconstruct. Um, this was right away deferred from fiscal 22 to fiscal 26. Um, US-19 from just south of Timberlane, north of this, um, to south of Lake Street, another add lanes and reconstruct. Uh, right away was deferred fiscal 23 to fiscal 27. And then reducing crashes and vulnerability, uh, 22nd Street South from 11th Avenue South to 5th Avenue South, this was a forward Pinellas priority. Um, was urban corridor improvements, um, construction was added to fiscal year 25. And preserving the system, these are resurfacing, uh, restoration, and rehabilitation, otherwise known as 3R projects. Um, State Road 590 from just northeast of Leonard Drive to Delaware. Um, this is in the eastern Clearwater and southwestern Safety Harbor areas. Um, PE was added in fiscal 21 with construction added in fiscal 23. And if I could point out, Jensen, we do have a letter from the mayor of Safety Harbor on that project to look at the possibility of bike lanes. Okay. We'll work with you okay. when the time comes. Yeah, no, no worries. <clears throat> State Road 580 from Shore Boulevard to Tampa Road. Um, this is in Eastern Dunedin to Oldsmar. Uh, PE was added in fiscal 21 with construction added in fiscal 23. Again, this is uh, resurfacing. Uh, State Road 693, Pasadena Avenue and 66th Street North from Park Street to just north of Tyrone Boulevard um, in the South Pasadena and Western St. Petersburg areas. PE was added in fiscal 21 with construction in fiscal 23. 
US 19A State Road 595 from the south end of the Long Bayou Bridge to Hoover Boulevard and 95th Street North um, in the Seminole and Bay Pines area. PE was added in fiscal 21 with construction added in fiscal 23. State Road 694 from east of Grand Ave and the Southern Frontage Road to east of State Road 93 I-275. Uh, PE was added in fiscal 21, construction in fiscal 23. State Road 699 Gulf Boulevard from north of 183rd Terrace West to north of 192nd Avenue. Uh, PE in Fiscal 21, Construction Fiscal 23. Um, this is in the North uh, Reddington Shores area in the intersection with Park Boulevard. Um, and I-275 State Road 93 from the northern end of the Skyway Bridge to north of the Maximal Point Bridges. Um, PE in Fiscal 21 and Construction Fiscal 23. And again, these were all part of that resurfacing that the Secretary was just talking about um, with those targets that we have. These are rigid pavement rehabilitation, concrete rehabilitation projects. Um, this is uh, 175 from east of 16th Street to 4th Street South. Um, PE was added in fiscal 21 with construction in fiscal uh, 23. I-375 from I-275 to State Road 595 and 4th Avenue North. PE in fiscal 21 with construction in fiscal 23. And I-275 from 54th Avenue South to 5th Avenue South. This was construction added in fiscal 23. And our bridge replacements, um, 40th Avenue Northeast over the Placido Bayou. This is construction that was advanced to fiscal 2020. Um, this was a project that is having local funds um, fund the construction with a payback in fiscal 22 and fiscal 24. The Ridgemore Boulevard and Brooker Creek at the Brooker Creek Bridge. This is up in the East uh, Lake area. PE was added to fiscal 23 with construction in fiscal 25. And so here are your uh, five-year total in millions of dollars. The total funding over the five years is $891 million uh, for Pinellas County. Of that, seven, just over seven and a half was for MPO planning purposes, um, just over $110 million for transit. That broken up in operations with $53 million and $58 million for capital. Aviation was just over $36 million. Capacity projects, just over $634 million resurfacing at just under $75 million, traffic operations projects just under $6 million, bike and pet at $5.26 million, sun trail at $2.47 million. Now a caveat with the bike and pet program, we do not have a good way of taking out the um, specific money on capacity projects that are used for bike and pedestrian infrastructure. So some of that bike ped money is actually captured under the capacity uh, monies that are there, the $634 million. And then last but not least, Complete Treats Project at just about $5.5 million. Now I did give everyone um, a card on the tentative work program, that's why I handed you before the meeting. Um, here are the next steps of the uh, work program and the tentative work program. October 1st and November 1st is the online public hearing and the website is on the back of that card that I handed out. October 30th is District 7's work program open house from 9 to 6. Come visit me. I'll be there staffing that. Um, so <laughs> come check out the work program um, in the non-online um, environment. November 11th, public comments are due. November 18th, the MPO objections are due to the tentative work program. And again, as the Secretary was pointing out earlier, January 2020 is a, when this tentative work program will be reviewed by the legislature and looking for adoption come July 1st of 2020 for fiscal year 2021 through fiscal year 2025. And again, thank you. And take any Whew. questions if you have any questions. That's a lot. Ones. It is. Yeah. <laughs> but that, uh, that little cloud over top of all of it, you know, that's too bad that uh, we're going out there. Any questions? If I could just clarify one thing real yep. quick. Um, <clears throat> one of the projects you mentioned was the Forest Lakes Boulevard mm -hmm. project. I believe that was a county incentive grant program. Was, so correct. just to, we didn't prioritize that. The county pursued that. Did you have? No. Okay. Yeah, Council. I, I have a quick comment about the uh, 22nd Street Complete Streets project. I just wanted to highlight that as we get into our next discussion about Tampa Bay Next and the location of pond sites because okay. there's a conflict. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Thank right, you, John. Thank you so much for it. All right. So what you, if, it's, if that's what you say. <laughs> okay, we're going to uh, go down into the I-275 Tampa Bay next PD&E study presentation.
Hello, my name is Ashley Hensel. I'm a representative of the Florida Department of Transportation. I'm the project manager for the PD&E study from I-275 from south of 54th Avenue South to north of 4th Street North. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the design change reevaluation and uh, the public hearing that we held. The purpose and need of the project is to provide um, operational or improve existing operational deficiencies, develop a solution to address present and future traffic congestion, maintain mobility for freight and goods movement, enhance safety, and better accommodate future travel demand. This study has been around for a little while. Um, back in 2016, we did a lane continuity uh, study from south of 54th Avenue South to Gandhi Boulevard. We also looked at adding two express lanes in each direction from Gandhi to north of 4th Street North. In 2017, we did a reevaluation that looked at repurposing one of those approved express lanes to a general use lane. So we ended up with one express lane, three general use lanes, and one auxiliary lane in each direction to match up with the existing Howard Franklin Bridge typical section. Now our current reevaluation study is looking at adding express lanes down to downtown St. Pete. So we're looking at adding two tolled express lanes from I-375 up to Gandhi, and then adding a second express lane from Gandhi up to north of 4th Street North. We're also looking at improvements to the Gandhi Boulevard interchange, um, where Gandhi Boulevard comes on to I-275 southbound, and looking at some improvements to I-275 northbound, how it connects to the Gateway Expressway. We're also looking at trail connections from the Howard Franklin Bridge over to Ulmerton and down to 4th Street North, as well as replacement of the 4th Street North bridges over Big Island Gap. Um, we're also looking at pond sites throughout the corridor. Something to note is that the lane continuity improvements that were previously approved remain as is from the uh, prior approved study. This is the proposed typical section. As you can see, we have two express lanes, three general use lanes, and one auxiliary lane in each direction. This would be from I-375 up to uh, Howard Franklin Bridge. And the express lanes and the general use lanes are separated by a four-foot buffer. So as I mentioned, we had to add some potential pond sites. There are pond, five pond sites within the FDOT-owned right-of-way and seven pond sites have been identified outside of the right-of-way. Those are on uh, amount to 28 parcels and may uh, require up to 16 relocations. We are working with the City of St. Petersburg and Pinellas County as well as the MPO and Swift Mud through an environmental look-around process so we can maybe have some joint use sites that would uh, potentially be able to reduce some of those right-of-way needs. Excuse me real quick. Yeah. The 28 parcels that is just, you said, that, what, 15 relocations? You're up talking to about 16 relocations. 16 relocations mm -hmm. means people's homes. Correct. Okay, just want to make sure that that's what we're talking about. And there are some vacant parcels as well that we're okay. looking at. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Yes. That? Are those all residential or are there any businesses mixed in? Um, there are no it's business not, relocations. All, all, all residential. residential. Thank yep. you. Uh, the reevaluation study also looked at an updated noise analysis to determine where we could add uh, noise barriers along the corridor. We also updated the traffic analysis. We have reevaluated the environmental impacts associated with cultural, archaeological, and historical wetlands and species and contamination. This is the uh, draft evaluation matrix that we prepared and showed at the public hearing that summarizes those impacts. So we held a public hearing on September 24th at the First Baptist Church of St. Petersburg, which is just off uh, the Gandhi Interchange. We had uh, 141 <coughs> attendees from the public. We had 11 people speak during the formal portion of the hearing. We had 51 written comments. Your uh, slide is wrong. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. We had 51 written comments. Um, some we received via the website, some we received at the public hearing, and one we received by mail. The comment period closed on Friday, October 4th, so we may still get some through the mail. Um, and then we also received two comments by uh, via the court reporter. Generally speaking, uh, the comments were positive regarding the uh, recommended improvements and especially related to the noise barriers. 
There were, of course, some concerns about the ponds and the right-of-way required on residential and vacant commercial properties. Most of the comments related to the pond sites were directed to one pond site, um, which was in the meadow lawn area. This is the funding that we have currently. So in our adopted five-year work program, we show right away in segments A and B in, uh, in year 2022 and design build in 24. I know Jensen just talked to you guys about an updated uh, tentative work program, but for the purposes of our study, we go on what's been adopted. So where are we in the process? Like I said, we just held a public hearing a few weeks ago. Um, we're working on compiling our comments and coordination report and updating any other uh, technical documents for approval. And we plan to have the uh, document approved by the end of this year or early next year. Could you go back to the previous slide just for yeah. a second? Um, the right of way acquisition, that, 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 is that also including for ponds yeah. and that kind of thing? Yes. So was the concern about uh, the, the homes that would be relocated or was it, or, and or was it concerning about potential flooding in the area? with increased demand for, I mean, increased water outflow? It was what? mostly concern for home, purchasing homes for, for right away for the ponds. We did have some flooding complaints. Um, Concerns. Not, yeah, not necessarily related to the pond sites, um, but mostly the concern for the right away was pond sites, taking people's homes. Okay. Yeah. Are there any, yes, council? So, I just want to understand, so, the proposed two express lanes each way is for segment B. Mm -hmm. You're looking at adding an additional express lane for segment C, which would bring the total to two. Correct. And then two express lanes each way in segment C. If we move south back to segment A, we I know we're focused on the lane continuity, but we're what I'm sorry, I, I lost track of what we're doing with express lanes there. So the express lanes would come down to I-375 and they would end. Okay. They would end at downtown St. Pete. Okay. Um, the, the other issue I just wanted to, to highlight for you, um, I don't know why comments weren't delivered, but you can expect some. Um, there's some concern about the proposed pond site, uh, 7B, mm -hmm. that's on your ELA work, 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 uh, worksheet. Yes. I know that looking at a map, it looks like there's a lot of vacant land, but mm -hmm. that's actually like right smack where the city has worked for years and worked with uh, Commissioner Ken Welch to address uh, revitalizing uh, that part of the city and it's it's a very important corridor that's in development so um, you can anticipate uh, staff reaching out to you uh, mm -hmm. to see what we can do to find a different location for that pond site okay thanks a lot uh, yes commissioner Watch. I absolutely support what uh, councilmember rice has said and a couple of us <laughs> have received comments on okay. facebook yeah, absolutely and i, I just want to thank y'all for going out and talking to the community first mm -hmm. so i think you've got an opportunity to really avoid um, Great just bad PR and mm -hmm. yeah if you go back with the history of 275 and what happened when it came into that area mm -hmm. it was disrupted and uprooted so there's just a whole lot of history there and I know the city's working on Commerce Park and other yeah. things so thank you all for reaching out first I think that's the way government ought to work yeah. and now you're getting a lot a lot of good feedback on that but I concur with uh, Councilmember Rice on that okay. thank you. any other questions for Ashley Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. We're going to move into the uh, Drew Street. Yeah, and I'd like, Street. we're going to have uh, Rick Hartman of the City of Clearwater come up, and I'd just like to say uh, that we partnered with the City of Clearwater on this project. We uh, helped fund the Drew Street project. Uh, most of, many of us who work downtown use this road all the time. And uh, we really appreciate the City of Clearwater's efforts, and thank you for being here. They have presented this to our advisory committees as well over the last several months. Thank you. Rick Hartman, Transportation Planner for City of Clearwater. Yes, so this is the outcome of the Drew Street Complete Streets grant that was given to us, awarded to us by 
Forward Pinellas. This project um, was actually brought to us by the community. There is Skycrest Neighborhood and other community associations that are on or near Drew Street. Um, requested the city apply for the Complete Streets of 2016 uh, grant program. Um, when we got the program and we uh, hired Kimley Horn and worked with Kimley Horn to get public input on what types of improvements can be most beneficial to all users of Drew Street. Um, and then in, uh, just to recap, September um, 2018, uh, we brought the concepts after a lot of public outreach and such to the uh, city council for their approval of the preferred concepts that I'll show you here momentarily. The goals were to improve safety, of course. This um, was known as a high crash corridor um, for vehicles um, as well as pedestrian and bicyclists. Um, increase accessibility and connectivity with surrounding land uses, support existing businesses, and promote uh, active living by um, increasing connectivity to the trails on both ends of the project. Um, public outreach was very successful. We had uh, two surveys that had over 2,200 people respond, and also we had two workshop, public workshops where we had 120 participants um, attend. Project area was approximately four miles. It goes from Osceola in downtown Clearwater out to US 19. Um, the challenge, one of the biggest challenges, is that it's, the corridor is, has multiple jurisdictions. So we are talking about a city component, and we're talking about a state component, and we're talking about a county component. So the first part, the city part, is a short area from um, Osceola to Myrtle. Um, typically, uh, you know, four lane undivided, and it, this is the existing segment. So this is what is out there at this moment. Uh, Ten foot lanes, some areas were nine and a half feet wide. So it's, it's challenging. Um, and also we're looking at how can we slow traffic down and improve that interaction with the surrounding land uses. So the council approved this concept, which actually provides for in increased buffering of the sidewalks, on-street parking on one side, um, and also to connect the trail to the, the Pinellas Trail into downtown, we are looking at uh, doing a two-way bike lane, protected bike lane um, as such. And we wanted to maintain that, that route on the north side of the road in order to connect to the trail. Um, that's why, it, although a two-way bike lane is not unheard of, um, it's a bit unusual, but that is what best served that connectivity as well as the businesses on the south side. We have a, a lot of small commercial businesses on the south side of this little section. So this was what the city council preferred. Did the public input, uh, ref, is that kind of a reflection of the public input as well, their preference, or was it a little bit different than? No, that's a great point because uh, during our outreach and during the uh, surveys, we got uh, overwhelming support for this is concept B of the three concepts that were presented and the public um, and the council were uh, all selected concept B. Okay, from so the that three was, that, in this section, it was kind of, they were kind of married together. Yes, and yeah. in the next two sections that'll show you, the okay. public uh, was supportive of the concepts that were selected by the okay. council as well. Okay. Or I should say the council was supportive of the concepts selected by the public as such. So the next part is the FDOT jurisdiction state road section which runs from Myrtle out to Keene Avenue um, and it's a four lane undivided road. This is an area that has a lot of residents, um, well established residential areas and driveways connecting to it and also is um, indicative of where we had a lot of vehicle and vehicle crashes typically left turn crashes as well as rear end crashes were the, the overwhelming uh, crash types on this section. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think this picture is a little bit misleading in that those, uh, those poles that are standing up are kind of more in the sidewalk. Uh, there's not a three foot lane. There's not three foot between the sidewalk, sidewalk and the street. 
And in many cases, there's not even a sidewalk on the south side. So, I mean, it looks nice. I mean, I know that area is very different yes. along the whole thing, but certainly some of the areas, that would be a welcome you know, improvement. Uh, mm -hmm. Clearly, yes. clearly this, is, this is a problem. Right. And it's not it, consistent, yeah. nor is it acceptable. Right. So. so it's really difficult to have one concept with, um, with this area that has many different yeah. features yeah. or missing Thank, many features. I just had to make a comment. Sorry. Just no, go ahead, it's a valid, valid point. So the, um, the council approved this concept, which was to enhance the sidewalk area, improve, try to add some protected features using the landscape medians for the turn lanes. Um, you know, one of the issues on the left turns was that, you know, people are in the lane and then there's high speed traffic coming up and trying to get around before they get stopped by somebody trying to make the left turn improve some of the visibility angles for people making the turn and also this would allow um, opportunities for refuges for mid-block crossings as well for pedestrians and bicyclists so those are some of the features of the concept that was selected um, and then the third sec segment is the county county portion from Keene to US 19 this is more of the commercial area where we have a lot of businesses along the road, although there are a few res there are some residential areas, um, and so we have to look at the different land use context and what the concepts, uh, the goals are, the concept of access to the businesses and such, and in a different audience as well. So this is typically it's a four lane divided uh, roadway, and the concept that was approved showed some enhanced landscape plannings again improving turning as well as the aesthetics along the road um, I'm sure everyone's been along there and it's pretty uh, uh, nondescript I'll, I'll say so to speak and also allowing placement for some mid-block crossings to improve uh, access pedestrian crossings you know and it's people going to these businesses as well um, and also uh, RRFBs the flashing beacons and at times. Could yes. you go back to the previous picture? Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you're really just, um, you're not really picking up any width here, you're just modifying. Yes, yeah. this, one of the keys to the concepts was one the uh, third scenario in each one um, was the shifting of curb, moving of curb, um, basically the infrastructure, uh, um, by moving the infrastructure, you doubled the price of the project. So as far as being cost feasible, it's something we want to get something accomplished. And, and so that was also something the council considered. Okay. Thank you. The other thing is that, you know, we have hot spots. We have some improvements um, that can be done at these intersections to improve crossings as well as uh, traffic flow so the consultants um, pointed out some areas that while we're working on these different segments and working with FDOT and the county and uh, WIT and his MPO crew on moving forward on s these concepts it doesn't mean that we're stuck in place so these are some of the things some of the areas where there are some uh, what we're calling hot spots that we can do improvements to the intersection designs the signalization and traffic flow um, to have things that can get into our budget and priority list more quickly and be done more quickly. So we're talking about Druitt Myrtle and Druitt Betty um, as well as Druitt Corona and then Old Coachman making, making these intersections work more efficiently for people to use and get across as well as trying to reduce conflicts between pedestrians, bicyclists, and uh, vehicles. And so these were also part of the, the plan that was developed and approved by the city council. And that's my that's, presentation. That's, that's it. Questions? Uh, well, um, well, thank you for the presentation. The first thing you said today was that it's really a challenge because we have three government groups. Now, to me, that, that, that seems like it would be the opposite, that we have an opportunity for local 
county, and state to work closely together on a project. And if the three entities agree that Drew Street is terribly, um, well, let's just say it's not a good road, uh, not well designed at this point, really with a lot of problems, I mean, at the very least, it was very interesting that when you have, uh, there's not enough room for um, handicapped pe folks to get there, unless they get into the road, which is about a nine-foot road, and the traffic, you know, like I said, that three-foot buffer of, there's no three-foot buffer. I, there's a couple of those mirrors that can't come close to hitting you. But it's a really bad deal. So I don't know, how, again, back to all of this discussion about how we prioritize and and how we start working together on this to make something happen. Um, I would like to see this road to be a perfect example of that because this is just just so subpar. Um, it's scary when you're in a car. I mean, trying to do these mid-block crossings because, you know, the, from one light to the next light is a long way. Yeah. <clears throat> Five lanes or four lanes to get across. And, there's, and if you want to get halfway across, you're standing on a double yellow line and I wouldn't want to be there, and I know anybody else would want to be there. So it's really, there's so many problems with this. Um, so I don't know how we start to really separate this thing, this road out as a, as a number one road of, of safety issue. I, I think we have to have that discussion and have it quickly. Because it, these little, I saw some of the, those interim things that we can do, and certainly you don't want to stop any of the interim things, but anyway. So just, just a, a, an off comment there. Um, any questions uh, here? No questions, just comments. Okay, well, look, can we hold on the comment just a little bit? We've got a couple of residents who would just like to make a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. First up will be Tanya Rotaco for two minutes, uh, if you will. Uh, Tanya, uh, do you want to go first? I'll give her time. I know, well, you're getting all of her time? Yeah. Oh, I thought she wanted to give up one minute. Are you giving up all three? Okay, come on up. We don't. We we uh, we normally uh, you know we normally need more than that, but we'll give you the the six minutes. I just stopped. <clears throat> yeah, well, hold on a second because uh, I just know that you will have to be carefully watched on your time. I'm just kidding you. Go ahead. I gave you the safe lane on the sidewalk. Yeah, yeah. All right. Go um, ahead. First of all, could you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Mike Reardon, and I was here last month, and I'm disappointed. Mr. Albritton didn't make it because he's our council member. Um, <coughs> Mr. Hartman, I believe, inherited this project because when I was going to these meetings that they were having, I don't think you were even, where do you go, a citizen of the, of, I don't think you were an employee of the, of the city yet. But as I mentioned, I've been asking about this for a long time. And I don't know who I'm more ticked off and disappointed in, the state, FDOT, or the city, probably equally. Because, first of all, I want the state to do away with this liaison position. They need an accountability officer. I called someone named Stephen Benson. He's in Tampa now. He gave, it was like talking to a used car salesman. And he was supposed to set up an appointment for you and I to meet, and I never heard back from him. I did have an excellent conversation with someone named Alex Henry. This is about 18 people from this FDOT I've talked to. When I was here before, I mentioned north and south. I meant to say east and west. The east side, the east gateway section of Drew Street, and then from Highland up to approximately Jasper. The city walked away. I, I don't know what happened, if they were working with the state or the county in 99, because they were talking about doing something about Big Bayfront, leased the Bayfront for 99 years for a buck or something like that, and they had to save the Bayfront and nothing happened. 20 years ago, the city abandoned doing the right thing. Something you were talking about, oh, it's 30 years, 20 years, and we keep getting pushed out on something. This has never been on the agenda for over 50 years. I know Mr. Albritton's been driving on it since the mid, mid or late 60s, and I don't know when you were driving on it. I have my license at 675. This is a horrendous situation. This needs to be fast-tracked, and I'm talking about the 1.8-mile section. They can do the rest of it later. I think the state needs to fast-track this it is the number one killing dangerous accident bodily injury road in Clearwater, the second biggest city in the county. It's number two in the county. I don't know how many of you read the entire presentation on Ford Pinellas, but it's a lot more detail than what was presented here in the little slides you saw today. Read about the, the, the people who live along there. I mentioned before they're marginalized. 
I mean, this is a joke. The mayor Credicos voted against the streetscape. It was a four to one vote. All they care about mm -hmm. is two lanes in and two lanes out to imagine Clearwater downtown. This was a residential section. Yes, it is arterial. It was never meant to be anything like this. There's many places where the white line stops because you can't, they don't do the outside white line because it's going into the sewer, mm -hmm. the storm drain. In some places you look down there and the white line curves. They just curve it around. I showed Mr. Eggers, I can't, it's telephone poles. I can't even put my two size 12 feet like this and not going into the curb. Well, get out there and walk this road. My invitation to join me on this road with free water is still open. My wife will pick us up and get us back one time if you have a meeting like we did with Mr. Eggers. Don't turn this over to the city. Make this an FDOT project. The city has had decades to do the right thing. Do not put them in charge of this. Do not allow them to do their feasibility study. Anything. Take control of this. You cannot trust the politicians. Someone recently told me, this isn't like this because professional, ethical staff engineers left it this way by choice. This is a political maneuvers in a poor area, and we've all seen it before in our own municipalities. Do the right thing. This one will give you the two-minute warning so that... Oh, I went off script anyway. I'm so pissed off. I know. That's why I was giving you the two-minute warning if you bring it back to... If you have questions for me, I encourage you to call me, email me. Or ask me out, Mr. Welch, did you have a question? I did, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, go ahead. And we're all politicians, by the way, so we're not. Oh, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but right here, you okay. can get together and, and do the right on, thing. Hold on, go ahead. Go so ahead. the segment you're concerned about is the Keene Road to US 19? Is that the Yeah, and it's actually about? a little bit west of Keene. You can see it. Okay. You're coming down on a bike lane. Yeah. You're going down the bike lane, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, oh, the road goes from 11 to 9 feet, yeah. right. or 9 mm -hmm. and a half, and there's no bike lane. And yeah. by that way, that, that thing that the city showed, that's a bad idea, bike lanes on both okay. sides of I the road. I just wanted to know which one, 1. 1.8 miles you were Yeah, to. just which, call it, just call section? it Keene. I'm sorry, which section right here? The green. It's just west of Keene. To US 19? No, no, the oh, other direction. The other direction. West, <laughs> west yeah. towards. Okay, so Keene to Myrtle. Yeah, yeah that, that section. And this merger of three municipalities, don't, don't yeah, worry about this. Said, the, the city of Clearwater section, I can stand, when I had a good arm, I could stand on Myrtle and hit Osceola with a rock. That little section right there, they could do that with Boy Scouts in a month. So it's Myrtle to Keene, not Yeah, what don't I worry about the city section. That's why I was clarifying. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Myrtle to Keene, okay. actually just west. You can see it. It's yeah. it's twenty years yeah, each, old. Each of those each of those areas, whether it's the city, the state, or the county sections, they each need their various improvements. But mm -hmm. the middle section, which is that the state air section there, is the real safety, big time safety area issues mm -hmm. that and, and handicap accessibility, width of roads, mm -hmm. trying to get across between major intersections, whatever it is, it just goes on and on. It's 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 really bad. Really scary. <laughs> and I doubt anyone here, if it was in your neighborhood, you wouldn't be doing something about it. And remember, I asked the city for over a decade, because I lived on Betty and could hit Drew, one of the hot spots. And hey, it's been eight, it's been 13 months. They're not coming in here now talking about this 13 months later. They haven't done anything on these hot spots. Nothing has been done. Don't trust the city of Clearwater to take over this project. Take it out of their hands and do the right thing. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Appreciate it. Is there anybody else that wanted to speak who's not here, uh, that, who didn't give me a card? I'm sorry. Anybody that's not, that's not here, well, let's hope they're not speaking. Um, anybody up here have any questions? Or Yeah, uh, Mayor Bujowski. What would, uh, what would the next step be? We've got, received this presentation. Um, we've heard, you know, the staff presentation, and we've heard, a re you know, residents' feedback. What would our next step be with? Well, uh, the, where does know. it go from here? Because there are all different sections. The there section. Are. Our job is really, you know, as you know, the, we're the convener, we're the facilitator, and what we're trying to do is get a, a consistent approach to this quarter, recognizing we've got these different things. And I agree with Mr. Reardon. I think this is a travesty that the road's gotten to the point where it has. Um, so we've uh, reached out to the Department of Transportation, and they are looking at what they can do from a safety standpoint. Um, to get something built out there in terms of sidewalk gaps and, and safety improvements in the short order. So we're working with them on that. Is we'll this the state, I'm sorry to interrupt, is this the state portion? It's the state portion, yep. So that's that portion. So the, the, the plan we just approved in the previ two previous presentations ago, 
this would need to be in that plan. This would need to be in that plan, so it would need to be added to that. Now, there are smaller push-button type projects that can go in that can be done under the safety program, and we just need to work through that process to see what we can do. So we'll work with the department on that. We'll get a report back as soon as they can give, it, give us one on what they would do. We've also had a meeting with the county where we um, worked with uh, the city staff to get the county engaged on their portion to see that they were okay with their sections, and so that's moving forward. The city has indicated that they are uh, looking at uh, finding funding to do an engineering feasibility study of the presentation that Mr. Hartman just presented. I've asked the, the city, D you said? The city. Okay. I've asked the DOT to see if they could do a single preliminary engineering design plan for the whole section, which would be city, county, and state, and just do it once rather than having yeah, yeah. Uh, an interim city feasibility study. And um, so they've agreed to take a look at that. So it's just a lot of moving pieces right now. So this... Uh Whatever the city has done in their study, and obviously we're getting the Reader's Digest version of it, we would really need the, the entities that oversee it, like the state, to do another study on top of it. Well, so this is at the planning or level. Or a confirmation. This is plan. a planning okay. level, so the next level would be getting into the engineering design. Okay, so not a study, but a... Not a study, but a, but a design furthering, study. Furthering right. the but there are some things that we could probably do right now, like just go fill the sidewalk gap. If, but we've got to understand feasibility, what, what that looks like and what a cost would be and how quickly that, that could get done. And one more, th one more question. When we're looking at this, um, I know there was a comment about the re uh, redevelopment or revitalization of the Coachman Park and the Imagine Clearwater and all of that. But whatever the new development, you and I have talked about this at the Eden Causeway. Whatever new development comes up or the ability of new development, all of that has to be considered when looking at the road. Mm -hmm. So either A, has that been done, or B, will that be done when these other things are being looked at? I think the city is looking into that as part of their, their work and as part of this concept plan. I mean, that's the planning department is leading the Imagine Clearwater effort, so... And there has to be a balance between yeah, the two. it has to be a balance. One doesn't oh, supersede the other. Right. I, I think the, the issue here, this is a classic... Which is important. This is a classic roadway where uh, <clears throat> there's four lanes of capacity and there's a perspective that uh, you need four lanes to move people in and out fast in the city of Clearwater, yet it goes through a neighborhood, uh, and it's a very unsafe road, and it's a substandard road. And to make it a standard road, you can't do it at four lanes without acquiring a bunch more right-of-way, which would be very expensive, or you would drop it down to one lane in each direction, and there's yeah. not... And I would hi highly suggest for folks to come and take a look at what we're trying to do to Skinner. Yeah. And what's on what has been done on Alt-19. Right. Yeah. There's precedent. None of those are four yeah. going to be four, four yeah. lanes. Precedent for that, sure. And I don't think any of the... There's not really... In some areas, you can't even finish sidewalk, and you certainly don't have... Because if you look because at the power pull. poles are the ones that separate right-of-way from private property, right. and they're already in the middle of the sidewalk. So, and you can't, so there's very little, there's not a lot that can be done. So I just think that um, the FDOT probably, they need to hear from us as a, as a board and as a community that this is ultimately very important. I mean, I'm sure they've gotten mixed signals over the years on this, on this project. So uh, I think the, the residents have come forward and spoken. The city has embraced it. I think that uh, we probably, uh, have we done that? Have we embraced the general plan of the we project? I mean, it's certainly the prerogative of the board if you want to send a message that you'd like to see um, yeah. action on uh, the concept. Yeah, plan. and I, maybe we can bring that next month uh, for consideration. Or you can do it right now if you want to. Uh, if the board, I mean, if you want to wait for Commissioner Albritton to be here, well, we can I just, do it in yeah, I mean, I just assume I don't, I don't really don't want to take a position right now. I mean, I'm comfortable with the position personally, but I just rather us come back, put it on the agenda, uh, make sure that Commissioner Albritton, who is from that city, understands that we we'll, we we will be considering that here. But I think I think that the it sounds like the the city of Clearwater has said so that that it was important. Same sounds like it, four to one vote. Yeah. Sure. That the county or the MPO would say it's important as far as the FDOT section goes. I'm sure we could get the. Tell you what, uh, if, you, if, if it's okay with the board, I will get with the Department of Transportation, I will get with the city. 
We will um, identify when we can come back with an update on next steps, and then we will uh, make sure it's a meeting where Councilmember Albritton will be here, and we will uh, ask the board for okay. preference. But, but yeah, let's sooner rather than later. Sure. I mean, I and we know we're not meeting in December, so I hate to let this go. So we'll try to make it November yes, or January. January. November would be best, if, but if we can't, I understand. Okay. We'll, do, we'll do the best we can. Very good. Okay. And, and I want to thank uh, Mike Raven for being here. I appreciate yeah. that, yeah. him taking the time. Okay. Um, and Tanya also. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Tanya. Yes. Um, all right. We're going to move on to the forward Pinellas legislative priorities. Go, go right ahead. Hey, again. board members, I think I can take care of this in fairly short order. The legislative committee met earlier today, so this is also our legislative committee update. Um, we have in your packet a draft set of policy positions for 2020 that match in many regards the those of the Metropolitan Planning Organization Advisory uh, Council. Um, the policy positions today we talked about, uh, the, the, sub, the committee took action to support the policy positions with one uh, addition. Uh, and so uh, just quickly, they are support urban agriculture um, to um, enable um, sensible regulation when you bring the farm to the to the community, farm to the neighborhood, uh, protecting trust funds, the Sadowski Housing Trust Fund in particular, uh, which has been swept into the general revenue uh, by the state legislature, and then supporting flexible and sustained transportation funding. Uh, to Commissioner Long's points earlier, uh, this addresses a number of issues, such as indexing fuel taxes uh, to, for inflation, uh, in, enabling the strategic intermodal system to be used to support regional rapid transit on an SIS facility. Uh, and uh, the addition would be uh, related sort of to the SIS because they're two sides of the same coin. Strategic intermodal system and the other arterials program that Chelsea talked about make up the lion's share of state funding for transportation. Um, and uh, so the language would be Ford Pinellas supports flexing additional funds in the other arterials program to enable urban corridor improvements that strengthen the safety and multimodal accessibility of the state highway system. Uh, and that would include funds being spent on parallel non-state roadways that support the state highway system because it's a network. Um, and in addition to that language, uh, the, tra the Transportation Regional Incentive Program, or TRIP, uh, the position is to uh, support sustained funding of $250 million a year as an incentive for regional partnerships. Uh, that funding was as high as $200 million. Now it's down to about seven to $10 million across the whole state. Uh, stop distracted driving. We made some progress in the last legislative session, um, but there is more that could be done for handheld devices uh, and texting while driving. Uh, and then maintaining MPO authority for apportionment structure and not having the state dictate uh, <coughs> governance and uh, MPO board constitution, that that should be primarily a local decision in consultation with the governor. And then supporting home rule. So uh, the only real significant change was that language related to the other arterials funding to um, add the flexibility so that that could be used for things like urban corridor improvements and not limited just capacity projects. Any questions? And, and the, the way we will use this is if the board supports this, is it would enable me as the executive director and our staff to speak about these topics uh, and write letters, meet with uh, our legislative delegation or state representatives and, and represent the interest of the board. Yeah. And when it's all, when approved, you can get this cleaned up and maybe send it to each of us also to so that we're all armed with that th that same information we'll while we're out talking to folks and to our legislative delegation yes and and we will bring up issues specific to certain bills as the session happens but this is really yep. a broad framework. I understand mm -hmm. yeah mayor bradbury um our city council um and chamber is going up next week so if the board approves, then I would like to be able to have this available to take with me. I think we can turn something around in the next few days. You know, if, if we kind of give a consensus of approval today, sure. then I can have. You can at least work off the draft. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Mayor Wojcicki. So a couple topics ago, we were talking about the, the, the funding ability of FDOT and finding a more stable funding source or 
maybe it's ab about combating what might be coming down the road. Mm -hmm. Where in there does that fit in? Well, I think the sustainable portion of the funding, because that's the real problem with the gas tax, is it's not sustainable uh, over, over a longer period of time, and that's why the Transportation Trust Fund is struggling in the county. It's okay. why the state is having a new, renewed revenue forecast. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Congress is beginning the debate of the surface transportation reauthorization. There will be no infrastructure bill. <laughs> We've talked about it for two years. Forget that. It's going to be done with the FAST Act reauthorization. Everybody agrees in Washington. Well, most everybody who seems to know something. So it's, this, it's up to Congress to write that bill. And um, the, those positions are forming. There is actually a position that the American Planning Association has adopted. I wrote that policy. Is anybody doing anything which is to, in Washington um, right now besides? Well, it's to advocate <laughs> we for the news? move to a vehicle miles traveled um, levy. So the more you drive and the more and the longer you drive, the more you would pay rather than uh, a gas tax, which is um, based just on fossil fuel consumption. Um, so and is this going to be for 18 wheelers that bring our goods to us? Yeah, they're, so they're looking at well, they're looking at a wide range of things, uh, but uh, you know they, they also impact the roadways more than cars do. They sure do. So yeah, so the number of wheels that are touching the ground has <laughs> it. <laughs> Some states have a weight factor. Yeah, um, I was going to say you well. go for a trip and that's what you see. Okay, so you can speak to it in, in the document you have. Absolutely. Yep. And I, I would and like to see us also address the electric cars because they're not paying the gas tax, but they're what, using the road. That's what we're that's talking about. Vehicle miles, yeah. miles, miles traveled yeah. would address yeah. regardless of fuel use. Yeah. Commissioner they're, Long. They're being green, but then, you know. Commissioner Long. Until we get to the elevated, you know, where you're, you know, the Jetsons going from one point to the other, then you wouldn't, you know, you still need the road. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just thought uh, it might be good in our uh, plea to the delegation if we could also stress that our local, our cities like Clearwater, Pinellas County, the regional governments that are supporting this also wax on to it because there's strength in numbers. We certainly will work with our legislative partners, our uh, staff members, to see if they can get that support. Mr. Commissioner Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Chair. Um, Commissioner Long has led a uh, Pinellas Day um, to talk to the legislature. Will we be part of that? I've talked to Brian Loeck a little bit about that, okay. and yes, that's uh, something that he mentioned to me that he would like us to be part of. And, okay. Yeah. And, and that's important that all of our messaging yeah. is... Consistent. Very targeted and concise. You can't have a list this big. They just don't, right. it, they go, you know, blaze over. Mm -hmm. And your plan was all the cities are participating Hopefully. in Pinellas Day? Yeah. They've been notified. Pinellas, Hillsboro, Pasco. Um, what was that date, January 14th? 15th, I think. Huh? The 15th, I think. The 15th is. Uh, the county, the, the, the three county days, but also Pinellas days, really. It's not just Pinellas County, but cities within Pinellas County, of course. Anybody. What is, what are MPOs dates? within Pinellas County. What, what are the dates? 15th, I think. Oh, October, November. No, November. No, no, January. 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 January, 15th. Mm -hmm. January 15th. We'll get that on your next agenda. And if you're going, get rooms quickly. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's the 15th. Yeah. Just that day, or is there a couple days? Just. Uh, that day. Pinellas County Day. Yeah. I'm sure people will be going up the, ni the night before and having opportunities to visit and chat. We will get you information on that. Okay. So we need a motion. Yes, yeah, there's a um, so approval. Um, approval. Second. Okay. <laughs> Did you get, uh, Let me get uh, Councilmember Gabbard and Commissioner Long. Any other comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Wit. I've got one item that I want to talk about, and then it's uh, an establishment of a nominating committee. But first, I just want to let you know from a uh, spotlight update, US-19 frontage roads. Uh, we had our first project advisory uh, group meeting on September 18th, involving all the local governments along the US-19 corridor that's being looked at from Pinellas Park North, I believe, to Tarpon. Is that correct? And um, that was a productive meeting. Uh, we have a subsequent email from the uh, consultant project manager 
and they are putting together a series of uh, stakeholder interviews, which will be held in the next couple of weeks. We're meeting as a staff uh, to identify stakeholder participants, and we will work with the cities uh, and the county along the corridor to make sure we get the right people uh, engaged in the stakeholder interviews. And remember, these are the, for the frontage roads that have already been built, which uh, have been built to a standard that was not great for walking and bicycling or for redevelopment or for safety. And uh, we're looking to see how we can um, retrofit that. So that's what this project's about. I think that's the main update I have on the Spotlight uh, project for now. Uh, the next item I want to mention, I'll skip over the Kennedy Report on Transit Funding just to say that I believe there's a Board of County Commissioners workshop November 12th, uh, which will be the next step in the conversation about transportation funding. Uh, the next uh, is the establishment of the nominating committee, and uh, every year we vote at the end of the year on a new makeup of our executive committee, a leadership of this board to take uh, place in, uh, in January. And if we are to form a nominating committee, we need to know now so we can schedule that nominating committee. Uh, if you don't feel like you need to have a nominating committee and would just prefer to uh, uh, appoint and, and vote from the dais, we can do that at the next meeting in November. So you just need to let us know if we need to form a nominating committee at this time. Um, I don't think you need a nominating committee because generally we do this in two year cycles and this correct. would be the second year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and, and, and make that at the next, make that selection at the next meeting. No need for a nominating committee. Is that consensus of the group here yeah, with everybody? Yes. Sure. Sounds good. That's yeah. an affirmation of your leadership, Mr. Chair, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It, it, <laughs> it's just an affirmation that that's what we're going to do. <clears throat> the, bring it back next meeting. We also have some appointments to our state and regional advisory bodies that we'll take up as well. So uh, that'll be part of the agenda next month. Yeah, and um, for appointments from, uh, from this board? This board, like to the TMA leadership group and the chair's coordinator. Could you send that out ahead of time, just so people can be thinking about that? I, I don't know. What is it you're asking for? For the other appointments. Oh, who's on them now? Yeah, who's on them now, and just so we we all know what we're going to be voting on, kind of ahead of time. Um, and anything else in that report? That is it. Just a reminder that our next meeting will be the adoption of the long range plan, and we are we are required by federal law to adopt it at that meeting or have a special meeting in December. Okay. And I would just uh, just say that uh, under informational items, there is a lot of good uh, good information there for folks that might be watching. There's uh, things from CPA actions uh, to plan, uh, plan amendments to fatalities map, Pinellas trail data, which is a lot of interesting information in there. Um, and just a lot of different uh, pieces of information that are good. I will tell you that the Citizens Advisory Committee has two vacancies, one for the City of St. Petersburg and one at large. And the local coordinating board um, has two openings, one uh, for a citizen who is a TD writer and the other one for, uh, for public education representative. So if you know of anybody, keep that in mind. Uh, are there any comments? Before we close, I have, I have yeah. a quick question. Yeah. The um, October 30th transit oriented development session at Clearwater SPC, what time is that? Two o'clock? Two, two to four in the afternoon. Two to four? Okay, thanks. And all of you are encouraged to join us if you are able. Okay. Yes. I just want to mention, and I'm going to lay it out here somewhere in case anyone's interested, but I have a map from 1950. Oh of the state goodness. of Florida, and there are no highways at all on this map, and there is no Howard Franklin Bridge, <laughs> and I thought you might find it fascinating uh, just to take a look at that it. That was back when they used to use the waterborne transportation and the airborne transportation <laughs> <laughs> so. to get to and from oh, that's pretty cool. multimodal yeah. transportation <laughs> of the 50s. Of course you would have <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> Commissioner Seal, thank you. Oh, yeah, that'll Anybody else? Or the, uh, she keeps everything. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody for pulling together and getting this uh, meeting, which was a lot of stuff, yeah, done actually a half hour early. So, Great job, thank you, Whit. Thank you. Uh, we are adjourned. Great job. Yeah.